Black Rifle Coffee, baby. Pretty cool. We're rolling. So this is this um, is called a this is called a cold open. We're just <laughs> opening this thing, ready to go. <laughs> How close do I need to be to this? Um, we can adjust it, but if as long as it's consistent. So for this, this is like four inches. That's about right. You You're raise you can raise yeah, it. Could yeah, yeah, raise it. That might have. You got a righty tidy lefty loosey. That's the way that works. <laughs> be tidy no, lefty loosey. You got to go right. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't want to tighten. Here, let me see it. <laughs> you, you, you definitely are better at it than I am. <laughs> I think my skills are a little rusty. No. <laughs> see? What, it, what happens is I, I just fuck with them. And, and it really gets good. them really nervous. And they're like, oh. oh, oh. <laughs> and start having like... <laughs> miniature brain traumas you know welcome to what my are they, world what are they, is it, it's, it's micro ptsd is that what it is yeah yeah yeah, yeah it's definitely something <laughs> working for me I, I i can't even imagine what that's like actually i do because i kind of work for myself it's not fun it's not that's what i tell my wife i'm like you think I like living in here? <laughs> like, 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 that's like, the real I, question. If there's anyone that's, that's more true. empathetic that's for right. you than me, I don't know who is because I live with myself. <laughs> I live in these thoughts. <laughs> I live so in this. here. I live in and, this. And the shit that goes driving by, <laughs> I tell you what, it, it it stops me in my tracks sometimes <laughs> for sure. And then I'm like, oh, hey, wait a minute. Oh. Is that is that from this point in my life or is that from this point in my life? <laughs> or is it? Just me. That's right. Yeah. That, that's, well, I don't want to answer that question. I, no. I mean, that's why we're always trying to be better people because we that's know right. how actually how we are inside. That's right. You know? That's right. And I figure if I if I load up enough uh, transactional morality, it will <laughs> transactional it, morality. It will it will fuse into a a consciousness that uh, uh, is imbued with uh, a real righteousness potentially. Yeah, I, I don't think we're born with it. No, I think you got to just grind away at it. Absolutely, you know, it's it's like a it's like granite, and you're you're just constantly forming it over the course of I don't know. Hopefully, we get to be like 80, 80 well, years well, old. I mean, I think that's an interesting question. Is and you know something definitely Doc can jump in on is is when does it form? Right. Um, there's a brilliant probably. One of the most significant things in Chris's book, and it's a quote from a guy named Derek Natalini, who's a former tier one guy and mm -hmm. did some other really amazing things. And he calls it this ambition of shame. And, and when I read that, I was in shock because just uh, a year ago, um, Dan Cirillo was on Eddie Gallagher's podcast and right. at the end, end of it, and they were talking about Operator Syndrome or the loosely talking about it. And and Eddie said, well, there's a reason I think it, it, it affects us all so dramatically. And it, he said, it, we live in this, this um, sense of permanent shame. And when I read this in, 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 in the book, and I saw it came from this guy, Derek, you know, that, that, you know, it's, it's a, it's a pretty intense idea, the ambition of shame, right? Mm. And it goes to that chiseling. It goes to that breakdown of, of, you know, the, 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 the overarching who you think you are prior to who you become in, and then the after effects of what's left. Mm. And I, I think, you know, shame is this component of all of this. And, you know, you, I think it was just a fascinating, you know, idea that, you know, it starts early for us in this pursuit of something bigger than ourselves. You know, my, my favorite stories with you are, are, you know, growing up with your grandfather out in the woods and that, that, you know, shaping of who you became. And then, you know, the stories obviously of, of your time in and, 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 and what you've done since. And it's like, you know, do you ever get to that space where, 
where you have you have the 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 final thing done mm. like you're staring at you know yeah. the david right and and you're like god that's insane man that's hardcore because we have sought out the truth but but the truths that we i think come across are much more intense and they're laden with some of these underlying things that are really exposed mm. as a result of the exposure and the time that we've invested in shaping that stone of of who we are right that's interesting. It's an interesting way to start this, just straight away. Dive right in. Yeah, dive right in. Which Dave you know and me, I, brother. Dave and I, Dave, <laughs> you and I always just dive in. We, we don't care. I, I, I don't know. I, do you, do you feel shame? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Like in, in what way, if you don't mind me asking? I feel the shame, um, that. From my time in, I feel shame that I let my teammates down repeatedly. Uh, leaving, I felt I let the community down substantially. Uh, in all the additional things I did, going back over. But but go. go sorry to interrupt, yeah, but please. yeah, I mean, no, I'm not sorry to interrupt because I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> go back to the beginning, before you got to the teams, I, before I, you got to the Navy. Yeah, I lived in a profound sense of shame because of my failures and not realizing the dream of playing D1 football, right. which I had completely invested my whole identity in. And when that collapsed, as a result, my inability to put my shit together, right. you know, I, it, it, you know, I, I free fall and I lived in that shame. I let my coaches down. I let my teammates, my lacrosse teammates down. I let my my family down in particular, you know, and, and so that, mm. that it was this real predominant shame that I was out of control. I was, it was no longer my control. Mm. And I think, you know, moving then into the community where it's built on that, right. It's really, there's a, a significant component of, of how far you're willing to go based on, I don't want to let you down. And, and, and I don't want to let, I don't want to let that happen anymore from my childhood right. or from my failures as a young man. So it's almost like you're living on the edge of potential more shame. That's right. Which drives you. That's right. Yeah. That's Do you right. find that's a, a common denominator? I think it's common. Yeah. It's not universal, but I think right. it's very common. The quote that I, from the book from Derek Natalini, uh, the ambition of shame, he, he talks about it as a, as a driver of performance mm -hmm. and a, a kind of a driver of the that mental, I'm going to use say toughness, but maybe it's the mental unwillingness to quit, to give up, to let down, to disappoint the people around you. What what a lot of us have seen in different ways, and this is this is partly when I talk to other nurses and doctors and psychologists and OTs and such. We see a, lot, a very high rate of childhood adverse experiences, whether that's neglect, physical abuse, sexual abuse. I don't know from an epidemiological perspective, I can't say with any certainty what that rate is, but it's high. It's right. very high. It's very common. And that's what Derek is talking about is how many people, how many guys, by the time they they get to selection, are already have already been affected mm. uh, by by traumatic and adverse and neglectful experiences that 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 break many people or hurt damage many people. I don't like the word break. I'm sorry I use that, but damage many people. Um, and some people take that and they they roll it into you know a motivating force for their life. Yeah, I think I'm just trying to reference and and look back on my individual teammates to to think yeah. about the the families associated with the guys that we served with and. It's fairly universal, right? It's okay. like they're, yeah. um, I think trauma, I, and I, I, I'm highlighting or using words I'm not necessarily 100% accurate, but I think dealing with neglect, some mm -hmm. of these other things yeah. when you're a kid, because, I mean, for me, I was a latchkey kid, right? So I was, my mm -hmm. dad was working, mm -hmm. my mom was working, they, they were both working. So basically from the age of nine on, I was raising myself. Mm -hmm. My dad was gone during the week. Okay. I was home on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And that was a forcing function to for me to go, okay, well, I have to 
put my life together at a really young age. It, wow. It wasn't because like neither one of my parents were were addicted to alcohol or drugs. Mm -hmm. They weren't they they didn't neglect me. They were actually very loving and polite, professional, amazing people, like really kind. But they had shit to do. Mm -hmm. Like it was just life, actually. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. uh, you know, my dad was affected by the uh, North America Free Trade Agreement when the logging or timber timber industry collapsed, and he lost his business. We moved into a different home. My parents got a divorce wow. because of economic situations and then they split. And then, but that was a, a very specific event in my life that I think shaped most of the rest of it. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And I, and I yeah. think that's, that's the core of when you look at the totality of the what, impact, right? I think it's, that's what it is, is this is a, is a is a study, uh, a personal expert exploration of of Doc through the eyes of 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 five hundred or so operators mm. that he's engaged with, either you know pro bono counseling or, or helping them with with different DBA claims and evaluations, and you know it's it's seeing the structure of who we are, right, and seeing. Or, or, or the revealing of the structure and what takes place, right? From, you know, because you you immediately, all right, where do you come from? What was the driver? What made you feel like you had to become an operator? Mm -hmm. And then, okay, that's great. So you have these underlying components of of a uh, emergent identity, right? That's looking for the thing to tap into. It's looking for the meaning. It's looking for the connectivity to that that higher order and then they we then there's he, he's i mean he some of the guys he's worked with are like i mean is are legends in, in right. our community over the last 20 years real 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 significant operators and they go all in and then more gets peeled away more they shape themselves down mm. into refinement right it's about that refining process the the deeper down in or the deeper out into the forest you walk the the more hardened you become the more prepared the more focused the more alert mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden it stops dave and i had lunch with derek earlier this week right in dc and we were talking about this and it's like yeah you all of a sudden everything comes to a halt there comes that day when you're no longer this you're something you've transitioned and it's time to be something else and you're not in that high op tempo then what then what i think that op tempo is is part of the it's part of the deal that allows many people uh, to keep going without feeling the consequences or exp or being aware of the consequences of what they've been doing Oh, I, I a hundred percent agree with yeah. that. I think yeah. that I see it with my peer group. I see it with myself. Like it's <laughs> idle hands. Right. And you keep moving. Like I, I've often referred to it as like, it's a shark, right? So you keep moving or you're going to die. Like you, yeah. there's, there's no sleeping here, yeah. right? Like yeah. you, you got to yeah. keep, you, you got to sleep keep. when you're dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I, I, well, by the way, I think there's actually part of this is like very therapeutic for people. So I'm, I'm like, I have mixed thoughts and, and, and different things around this because I think when guys do stop and they don't have something to immerse themselves into mm -hmm. where they're dedicating all their time, their energy, their emotional and intellectual capacity, that's when things start to get really dangerous for them yeah, because. For sure. Well, I, I, I agree. Okay. I agree, Evan. And I, and, but part of what, I guess part of what I was trying to say is that, that, that onslaught of the op tempo as an operator, as a contractor, same thing it is, you know, you don't, you don't take time to grieve. You don't take time to, you don't have time to grieve. Not really. Right. You don't have time to, to really stop and think about the men and the women that you've served with who are no longer here and their children and their families and, and things of that, of that nature. When you, when you transition, when a soldier transitions into civilian life, absolutely needs to have that mission and purpose. Mm. And without it, without it, he or she is going to really be in a world of hurt. So I agree with you from that in that in that sense. But at the same time, for most people, 
that's a hard to find for one thing. Mm. I mean, you've you've crushed it obviously with with your work and your what you've what you've produced and done since since you left the the, the community, it's the professional relative. community. <laughs> Every, everything's <laughs> relative. <laughs> We're gonna, you're going to have to write an operator syndrome <laughs> part two for operator entrepreneur. <laughs> entrepreneur, yeah, so right. right. Uh, but but for you know for most people it means there are now there's time at home in the evening, mm. sitting on the couch with the family. Hopefully, there's there's time to reflect, and at that moment, a lot of things come back. A lot of things, you know. There was a there was a line in in the TV show Seal Team, uh, one of the earlier seasons, which is something I I had heard multiple times up to that point. So I don't want I don't want to say it's a cliche, but I think it's it's a powerful point. How many guys who are no longer here? Are still in your phone. How many names in your phone do you still carry? That? All of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All of yeah. them. Yeah. I don't delete any of them. Hmm. And there's a couple I still have phone messages from that yeah. I listen to. Yeah. I do too. I've got I've got names in my phone. Not that I ever. I'm not a warrior. I never served um, in any capacity overseas. But uh, I have names in mine that I don't. Uh, I don't delete or cut out. Which I do that all the time for some people who are no longer relevant to my work or, or right. my life. Um, when do you stop? When that merry-go-round stops, when the music stops, mm -hmm. when do you, when you're in that seat and you're alone with your thoughts and your feelings and your memories, at what point does some of that stuff start to come over and can it take over um, if, if allowed to? That's kind of what I think you're talking about here. Absolutely. Yeah. It's really interesting I because I, I think about this quite a bit. You know, this is a constant conversation, you know, inside the walls of the company. We are talking about it like we have almost a pre-built support network because mm -hmm. we have a bunch of guys that were serving in either similar or the same units, doing similar or the same things. And it's it's a constant conversation around like what did we used to do and what do we do now? Uh, how do we help? How do we help our 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 peers out there? I mean, the the GWAT for most of the country is gone, oh, forgotten. Totally, it's gone. It, it, it's it almost was erased. It was yeah. barely there to begin with. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's a constant and ever present memory. Yeah, you know, I well, Iraq kind of runs like like software in the back of my head all the time, right? <laughs> it just kind of runs. Yeah. And that's a great way. It just runs mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter. It could be, you know, a, a sight or a smell or something happens like rose water. I was thinking about this the other day. I was talking to my wife about it. We were walking down the street in Seattle, right? So we're, we, we went out to Seattle for our anniversary and you know, my wife and I are like very, very peculiar, Congratulations, pe peculiar people. Way. Yeah. Thank you. It was like, like we're coffee people. So like we, we went to Seattle because we could get like 20 different cups of coffee a day, depending on where we were going. We could walk the city and like do different things. And then we're just assessing the way that coffee shops were serving coffee. Like she's, she's my partner in crime when it comes to this stuff. Well, how long have you been married? 11 years. Good for you. Um, it's, she, she met me after you know, well, we, not even well after she kind of met me right when I was finishing my career at the agency before I, I got fired <laughs> and uh, for <laughs> all the right reasons, by the way, totally, uh, totally the right reasons. Totally. And uh, that's the way most of those careers end. Yeah. 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 yeah I think careers. I, and I, I was, I was talking to her about like, I came home from my, my first trip cause we were walking under this underpass and I, I came home from my first trip and they're, they're the, the sections of an overpass that are connected and they have these gunk, 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 and it sounds like indirect. It's loud underneath an, an underpass. And I was, I parked my truck and was walking into a, a bookstore and it goes gunk, gunk. And I was like, Ooh, and I'm like, I, I was looking for cover because, <laughs> because a week prior mm -hmm. I was in Najaf. Like That's it right. wasn't even a week. It That's was right. like, it was four days, dude. I was like yeah. in Najaf and then you know, in Seattle, like searching for cover. And that reflex is what kept you alive mm -hmm. overseas. In, it's a survival. 
reflex. Survival, it, 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 we were talking about w- like the smells, right? You know, the perfumey yeah, smell of the interior of a, of a house. Yep. That's like there's that, 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 uh, fuzzy blanket that they all have like like <laughs> and you can feel yeah. and smell yep. certain things that like it's it's like triggers and then it goes straight back for me it's raw sewage yeah oh yeah yep. it's like it's immediately immediately yep. immediately i'm in cobble immediately yeah yeah like when, especially when you when you when you fall into one of those trenches and you're up to your nipples and human shit and you're like this is not what I thought. This is this not is what not I thought my commando cool, experience man. was going to be. This is not. I didn't hear. I didn't see this in any of the movies. Like what, I, I'm covered in human Stop shit right shit, now. John yeah. Wayne never did that. Right? Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. John Wayne didn't do this. Now, yeah, Charlie granted, Sheen always looked good, dude. <laughs> he had an MP5. I did I had black pajamas. I didn't have any of that. Cool I look shit. like a dork. Right. I. I and I. I was more referencing the fact like there's so many guys that I know, whether they're in the company or outside of the company, it's my peer group. It's they're my people. It's my community. What I always tell people is like, I'm the last one in line, right? Mm -hmm. Like I look to take care of my family. Like that's like number one. And then the company and my community, my community encompasses like the veteran community. And then like my town and my country bit, I'm all the way down at the the very end, but that's the way I've, I've kind of organized my entire prioritization of effort. It's like, here's number one. And then I'm all the way down here at five or six or wherever the fuck that ends, but it's all the way down there, but it actually does help me because I'm like, this isn't about me. It's about somebody else. And it helps me. And I don't know if it's good. I'm not trying to defend it saying it's, it's more about other people than it is about me. And it helps me still be very selfless in my endeavors and maintain mission focus. It's still about service. Yeah. That's right. And that service brings meaning, mm-hmm. which is everything. It's duty, right? It's mm-hmm. duty. And, uh, and, and I'm interested from uh, just a curiosity perspective out of the guys that you're interviewing in 500, give or take. At least. So when, when, you, when you talk They'll about- They'll never be honest with how many know. people's lives is saved. No, it's, 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 like, it's substantial. It's substantial. So explain mm-hmm. to me the operator syndrome sure. the outside of what, what we would read in this in your own words, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's pretty easy. Um, but, but can I tell a little bit of a story first, just to kind of lead into kind of some of my early thinking? Mm-hmm. My, so I'm a clinical psychologist, worked at the VA for 15 years from 91 to, well, officially 92. I was a trainee in 91, 92 to 2006, and then left because I left the VA. As much as I liked working with, with the veterans, I did not like the system, and the system was was kind of unhappy with me for asking some of the questions I was asking and some of the data I was publishing and, and such. So it just became not the right place to, for me to be at that time. Uh, fast forward a few years, few years later, I was working in Houston and had a lot of friends from the soft community uh, who I had made, and some of them were were guys that started talking to me about their you know their their difficulties in life. And you know, as a psychologist, my first thought was, well, this is probably anxiety, depression, PTSD kind of stuff. Pretty simple. I got this. It was far more complicated than that. And so my expertise really initially was not worth much in terms of helping them. So we started doing blood tests and sleep studies and and some other things. And so what emerged for me was it was started because, and it took a couple of years, um, but I kept seeing the same pattern of, of injuries and impairments, functional impairments over and over and over again. And these were not things that I would have expected and certainly probably not things that most American civilians would have expected. So if I, if I just go down the list, and, and I'll do that real quickly, traumatic brain injury, sleep disturbance with insomnia, and sleep apnea. Like, what? Sleep apnea? How do young guys have sleep apnea? That's a, that's a thing for old middle-aged dudes. These guys weren't, weren't old or uh, middle-aged or uh, obese. Mm-hmm. Uh, low testosterone, almost universal. 
80, 90% of the guys I work with, either it's diagnosed as low or it's at the very, very, very bottom of what medicine calls the normal range. Chronic pain, headaches, orthopedic problems, and then you get the ball of, of depression, anxiety, anger, hypervigilance, um, which, by the way, psychiatry view, views as a symptom. I view it as, a, as an adaptation. It's a survival reflex. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, there may be times where you want to be able to turn it down a little bit, which, which I'm guessing most of you have done. PTSD, okay, we could come back and talk about that as much as we like. Substance abuse, addiction. But then there's then, you know, going back up to the TBI and the endocrine problems, there's some other issues. There's the problems with the perceptual systems, vision, hearing, balance um, are all impaired, typically impaired, cognitive impairments of memory and concentration. How, how's your, 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 you're trying to learn some stuff horrible. right now. How's that going? It's horrible. Yeah. It's Absolutely hard. To, it's horrible. really hard to learn new things uh, with a TBI. Then, of course, there's no way you can have these issues that don't ripple over to your family, your mm. friends, your work relationships. Uh, so you got that. And then you have the, the well, the low testosterone affects sexual functioning. And you have the, the whole pile of existential experiences and concerns that have built up. So emotional intimacy is also difficult for, for many, many guys. Then you also have a military to civilian transition, which is hard. I mean, it would be hard for me to have to transition to a whole new profession in life and, and culture. Um, I don't think I, I don't know what I would do. Um, you have toxic exposure illnesses and cancers, which, which we're only about to really learn about more in the near future, I think. Mm -hmm. SOCOM, General Fenton just put out a memo saying we're going to start studying this now within SOCOM more more formally and systematically. Then you have the existential concerns, guilt, loss, grief, moral injury, shame, whatever whatever words we want to use. Loss of tribe, that's a big one. You've built a tribe around you in your business, which is just beautiful, not only for you, but for people who 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 work with you. And then, you know, last, uh, I don't I don't have it on a on a list, but there's a chapter on it in, in the book is suicide. The rates of suicide in the in the soft and contractor community are just sky high. Mm. Typically, when I interview guys, um, guys I don't know, guys I'm meeting for the first time, within two or three or four conversations, they will tell me about the the list of five of their best friends who have died by suicide, or eight close friends, or twelve close friends who have died by suicide after coming home. Um, I hear of suicides in the broader community across all branches, and I work with all folks from across all of the branches. Harrison Tinsley, Mike Day, Gabe Accardi, Mark Miner, Jeff Enderlin, Bruce Cunningham, Mark Crampton, Bill Mulder, Dave Hall. That's in the last six years. Dave, Dave Collins, Vito Cowley. I mean, I'll stop I've there. one on here. Mark Crampton was the former command master chief, team one, when I was there. Guy was retired after 30 some odd years, gets out, kills himself. Robert Ramirez was the f acting CO of SEAL Team One and two Decembers ago took his own life. He had three children, nine combat deployments. And, and the list just keeps going on and on. And, and from what I'm hearing, it's it's been, I don't want to call it suppressed or whatever, but obviously at the tier one units, they're much more tight lipped and it's, mm -hmm. it's a real problem. Mike uh, Day. That was a hard one. Mike Day had just published, I mean, one of the toughest guys ever shot 27, 27 times, times on yeah. target. Yeah. Grenade, uh, grenade shra shrapnel mm -hmm. killed the, the three or four, um, insurgents in the, in the room who were shooting at him. He survived that. Wow. And then he writes years later, writes a book on resilience and then, Three or four years later, he's dead. So it it's a, I mean, it, it hammers guys. And and usually by the time we get to this part of the conversation, uh, at least one of us, if not both of us, are, are tearing up and choking up a little. Yeah, <clears throat> it's interesting how you, when you go through the list and, you know, I, I, go, th I, I go through that list, which is, like I go through that list. And so 
like the TBI, sleep disturbance, sleep disturbance, chronic pain, depression, anxiety, anger, hypervigilance, uh, post-stress or post-traumatic stress, substance abuse. So like I can see all of these things. Now I've never seen them on a list. So I've never seen That's them on it. a list. And because it's easy, I think, from my perspective, which is an untrained observer and a person experiencing different levels of each and every one of these, and then also seeing my friends and the people that you care about work through these issues every day and trying to figure out like how to combat it because it, selfishly it it's it's like a nuclear bomb goes off in your in your family maybe. every time every, every time yeah every and time. depending you know last year um um was two years ago now neil curry um you know he was not only one of my best friends but his sister-in-law is my ea you know his wife was also working with us and like our families were completely interconnected and on a whim he decided to take his own life i'm sorry brother yeah and that just like just it's like a nuclear bomb goes off in your family devastating. it's devastating across all all aspects of your life everything gets reset and then you're trying to figure out you know why or you know how do i help how do i directly plug in and make sure that his family's okay how do i make sure that you know my other friends are okay and then you start working you start working the problem set mm -hmm. right you start working the problem set but i see it from different angles and i've i've tried to attack it at different levels from the sense of like you know toxic exposure has been an, a really big thing for me the last few years because my really close friend, Josh Ralson, he died of lung cancer mm -hmm. at like 40 years old, never really smoked a day in his life. Just, I went to his funeral six months ago. Oh, man. But then walking around the funeral, there's a hundred guys there. 30% mm -hmm. of them had some type of cancer. One out of three. Yep. And so this is all my, my peer group of guys that were, you know, commandos, larger than life bad ass bad dudes. motherfuckers bad motherfuckers yeah. and uh, i got prostate cancer or i've got yeah. this cancer or i've got this and and so now you're you're reconciling multiple different things because you know i'm talking to my former commander that that, that i know really well and i can see it weighs really heavy so he's he's getting more of the emotional and psychological component because he's watching Mm -hmm. Guys that he led either kill themselves or die of cancer and they're attriting out. Heart attacks. Yeah. Strokes. It, the list the, uh, is so profound. Post-surgical complications from routine surgeries, but but like if it's your 20th surgery, orthopedic surgery, That's right. right. every time there's an increased, you know, there's a slight risk every time. So you're rolling the dice. And no. we're not talking... And, and and this is I know we talk about this you know <laughs> time is so ingrained into us regardless of 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 the construct of our the end of our lives right just from training from a sense of of purpose every day right. like I love the way you you know you listed out the order of the hierarchical order of your purpose right and each one of those components is relative to the amount of time you can infuse into those relationships every day but yet and so we're constantly like i got to get to it i got to get it done and i think now when you get out and you start to see all of these um these warning signs and that's what i look at the untimely death of my friends and, you know, Dan Sorello last year, March drops dead of a widow maker the year before he had a stroke, right? At 50. And, and so for me, it's like, man, Hey bud, your time yeah. is, is real now. And it's not like, you know, I, I had this 
14 years where I went and did this other thing. And now I got to make up for that time from a financial or business or accomplish what, no, it's like, no, your time's ticking. Right. Your real time is ticking. And that's, that's powerful. And, and, and I, for me, meeting Chris and having him wrap this all up has now given a structure to what I need to do in that time to really maximize my time. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So so if I could say maybe just a few more things, I think an important point of what I call, and, I, and other people are calling operator syndrome, is these injuries don't occur in isolation. They're all interrelated. Your TBI makes it hard to learn. Mm-hmm. Having difficulty learning makes it hard hard to do other things with your life. TBI causes uh, and affects your hormonal functioning. It affects your sleep. It affects mm-hmm. your headaches and cognitive functioning. Chronic pain is going to affect sleep mm-hmm. and is going to affect mood and relationships and, and on and on and on. These are all interconnected. And modern medicine um, doesn't know what to do with that. Doesn't We don't have a... We're very fragmented in how we approach treatment. So you might go to one specialist who, who addresses one issue but doesn't even ask or think about the other issues. Um, and if you go to three specialists, they're each working kind of their own lane, but they're not coordinating with each other right. in terms of what they're doing. A second piece point I want to make is I call this, you know, the, the word operator in here. Um, operators have a magnitude of order uh, difference from mo- in terms of their exposures, the allostatic load from most veterans. What does allostatic mode mean? Ah, okay. Allostatic load is a is a phrase. It's a term that refers to. I mean, it's really a hypothetical, but it mm-hmm. refers to every single thing that's vectored mm-hmm. onto you. Um, so that's the the frustration of being sitting in a in a traffic jam. It's the loss of a friend. It's the injury that you sustained while you were running. I mean, we all have some some level of allostatic load mm-hmm. that we we experience, but the magnitude with the blast exposures, the high op tempo, the training uh, impact, the rucking, um, all of that on operators is massive. But operators aren't the only ones who this framework is relevant to because I use it with other veterans and I'm now working with firefighters um, I have a really a good friend, J.D. Miller, who's a Canadian firefighter. She reached out to me. She said, this stuff, this we have, firefighters have this too. So I'm working with her on solutions for for firefighter community through, through a small company she's formed. Um, law enforcement, other first responders. Um, so it's not just unique to, I mean, Perhaps the magnitude and some of the issues are unique to operators, but it's a, it's a, there are other people, uh, other men and women in our society doing, you know, dangerous, rigorous jobs uh, and, and suffering uh, from, as a result. One of the interesting, just to interject the, the level of that magnitude, police officers, you know, it doesn't matter where you are in this country, police officers at any level experience seven massive traumatic experiences yeah. a year. A year. Mm-hmm. At least. At that's least. The, that's the average. That's the average. The average yeah. Much less if you're mm-hmm. in a high crime rate or and firefighters are right. right up there. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And and they're working in their own communities. They're not doing something far away. They're they're putting on that uniform, you know. Yeah. I mean, I can yeah. see it. I can see them age. I can, oh yeah. I can see them age. And yeah, it it it's interesting to see when guys get out and how fast they start to age. Like within a couple of years. Yeah, you're you can really notice it just from looking at at the way their appearance is, and it's not. It it, it seems like like they're accelerating, and you see it in just their yeah. just visually in their face. Yeah. Well, and a lot of guys are go from mill, so they go from. You know, I, I know a ton of guys went from SF or wherever, and then they went into law enforcement right yep. after that. So mm-hmm. they go from yep mill to police work. So they might have 10, 15, 20 years transitioned directly into police and fire for another 10, 15, 20. Yep. And now they're 60 years old and they have all the pre-existing baggage that they picked up from the, the their, their military. Now they have all of their police and fire yeah. and their community plus. service that they've done plus, plus, plus. I, I, I kind of going back to the way that I've been looking at this 
And that's why I've never organized it like this, but like these are all the things I've tried to eliminate out of like just eliminate, which would be the uh, marital and family concerns, right? So that's a good one because investing in your time, investing your time and yourself into your family and really like, trying to be a good father or like trying to be a good husband, mm -hmm. not creating excuses because I, I see it. I see it within myself. I see it within my other friends where they create excuses where it's like, Oh, it's, you know, fuck it. You know, like I was gone for the majority of their life and, you know, I was on the road and I'm just, you know, she doesn't understand it. She doesn't know the team. She doesn't like, okay, dude, but excuse. Yeah. And she's had her own, her own challenges and struggles related to the life that a spouse yeah. of an operator oh, I'll tell you a, a personal story. John and I had, had started dating. We decided to get married. We're going to move in together. She sold her house, and we were up at her house, and I think the girls were probably like probably seven, eight, nine, and, and 12, right? They were still young. And we go over to the house, and my John is youngest, and who is the most beautiful human being, right? She locks the keys in the car with it running, and I flip out on the street. My mom's there, the kids are there, John is there, and I flip out on this little girl. Like, what the hell are you doing? You got to think, you know, what are we going to, you know, and I, and I, like stop and I pull up and I look around and, and everybody's just frozen. Like what is going on? And I turned and ran into the house, went in the back room, laid down and just was like, what the hell is going on? And then I had to go out and pull Gracie in and, and I had to explain, Hey, listen, Hey, listen, this is happens to me every now and then. And what's interesting, it was prior to Chris publishing, you know, the original paper on it, which was in February 2020, it was prior to that. And it was, I was like, holy shit, something's bigger. It's wrong. I, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't have a regulator. Mm -hmm. you know? and I don't know why I can't regulate. I should be able to. And, and that was really, I think, where I recognized, you know, because we started initially working when I was doing the show with Marcus and I was going through my divorce, a, a mutual friend connected us and it was beneficial, but I was like, nah, I'm good. I don't have the other stuff. Right, I'm good. Right. It's just the stress right now. I'm good. I work through all my stuff. I'm good. I already mm -hmm. did the work. I'm I'm okay. I got my faith and I'm good. And I'm, but no, I wasn't. And I remember, you know, that recognition, the realization that, Hey, there is more. It's not simple. It's, it's, it's very complicated. And, and, and there has to be this framework of how you address family, how you address. And I love that you're, I mean, listening and, and paying attention to your focus in the midst of all this other stuff you've been doing. I'm like, all right, he's doing the work. And I think, you know, it, I think that's a critical aspect, but it, I think a lot of guys don't know where to begin the work. They don't know the extent of what's going on. And, and I think that's why a frame this framework helps people so much well it was it was it, it's interesting hearing this and then the 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 concept in which i was trying to accomplish was i, I realized i couldn't leave the team room right I, I understood that about myself like i can't leave the team room like it's too ingrained in me i grew up in it like i've been in it my entire life like going into corporate america like was was like looking into an abyss of depression mm -hmm. going like this is not going to help me, nor am I going to be able to fit in. There's no fucking way. Like I'll be able to do this. Like I know, I, I knew that at least about myself. And if I go back, like I was really not happy with myself at all. I mean, you and I have talked about this a lot where I didn't have, I had emotional range for hate. Mm -hmm. I had a default, mm -hmm. my default emotion was anger. Mm -hmm. I had no other spectrum of emotion. Uh, I didn't care about anyone except for dudes that were in the military, like soft guys, like, mm -hmm. like, okay, I have a profound amount of love and respect for them. 
And my fear was this is not who I, I wanted to be, nor is this who I was. So the time and repetition of deployment after deployment had essentially robbed me of what I really felt was very important, which was love. I didn't have, mm -hmm. I, I just void of it. And that scared me more than anything else. I'm, you know, having a baby at the time and, you know, truth be told, I was having a really hard time connecting with my new child. <sighs> Brutal. And it was the worst, it was the worst experience and ever. It was not only the worst experience, it was so depressing. What, what was that about? What were you seeing and feeling? I didn't have love. Yeah. And I had, I had respect. For, I had respect. I could, I could analyze things and I could create a, a respect checklist. Like, this is very logical. And I could think mm -hmm. through it and say, mm -hmm. this makes sense. This is, these are the reasons why. But then the emotional range to say, well, this is, should be the most important time of my life. Like the birth of my first child, the thing that I've been looking forward to my entire life. And now I'm just dead. Like I'm dead inside. Dead inside. And it was fucking horrible. Yeah. It was like, I was laying in bed and my daughter's at the the foot and she's in her crib and I'm staring up at the wall and I'm like, I'm not dead, but I'm fucking dead. Yeah. This is worse. Yeah. This is like, mm -hmm. like it was just like glaringly obvious. And I wrote this mission, I wrote, I wrote a mission statement, which was to transition out of military service or government service and live a happy and fulfilling life. That was it. Like that, that was it. That was the mission statement. And it was the genesis to be able to just say, okay, this is where you're at. <laughs> Not good. And you noticed it. Oh, absolutely. It, it was, was, it was, it yeah. was like, where do I go from here? Yeah. Because everything that I've really wanted in my life, like I survived Iraq, gone to Afghanistan. I fully expected to die which is like a whole other issue yeah. where it was like, Hey, I just figured I would die somewhere in the desert and that, like, it wouldn't matter in your way. So it was like, you're already dead. You've already, kind of already committed yourself mm -hmm. to the mission success to the point where you're saying I'm already dead and you're living as a dead man for so long. You, you have a mindset that discounts the future because the future isn't expected to be there. For you. No, yeah. it doesn't exist. The future doesn't exist. And that's when and, and can't rate. It doesn't matter either. It doesn't compared, matter compared to what I just did. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it wasn't me. I was like, you know, I, I my my dad's a good guy. Like my my mom's a good person. My family's, you know, loving and humorous and they're they're not like cold, callous, calculated, stoic people. They're like warm and gregarious. Like yeah. I'm not that guy. And it, uh, it was like, it was just really embarrassing. It was like, so embarrassing. They're like, okay, well, what do I do? <laughs> because that's what I wanted. I wanted more than anything else just to be able to connect with my kids. Yeah. And. What did you do? How did you pull yourself out um, of that space? You know, I'm, I'm reluctant to talk about it all, I guess, but it was. Um, part of this was like, you, 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 what's that saying? It, it's uh, fake it until you make it. Get your reps in, mm -hmm. and like, just keep repping it out. And part of that was, you know, I love my wife. You know, eleven years, you know, of marriage, which we all know is work, right? <laughs> but more importantly, like, hey, I've got my, my daughter that I have to have, like, I have to have a relationship with and I have to have this emotional connection with. And it was rep after rep after rep, 
hug after hug after hug to just try to just break down this like wall that I had purposely built. And it was, so it was like, it was just like chipping away, like one hug at a time, away. one story mm -hmm. at a time, mm -hmm. like carrying her around in the, in the, you know, the little chest rig thing, right? Where <laughs> you're, you're, like, you're, you're multi-cam bejorn. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and it was like very logical. It was like very process driven. It was, it was crawl, walk, run. <laughs> like it was mm -hmm. like, okay, there's a process here. Um, and I, I've never actually talked about it. Um, you know, but it, it was this acceleration was, I guess, preparation for our second child. Um, it was the community interaction between what the company and people that I've known. And then ultimately a lot of conversations and then I followed up with a fairly robust psilocybin session several years ago and what it did for me which i'm not promoting it for anyone was um it kind of unlocked an emotion that i had forgotten about and it gave me dexterity with mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. okay. i didn't have it and it was interesting because i reconnected with this feeling that i was only processing like this is where i should be but i don't know how to reconnect with it um, and that was my, the time my second child came, which you know, she came down you know, for almost four years, three and a half years later, it was gone. So it took me four, almost four years. Diligent focus. Diligent yeah. focus of connect, rep, connect, rep, connect, just reconnect. I mean. In, as we look through this, it's like, okay, what are the clouding things that will impede on the success of what I'm trying to accomplish? I think you're spot on right there. I think that's the challenge, guys. You 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 went through the the Q course of 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 intimacy, right? We're so conditioned to respond to the intensity of our chosen our chosen potential. Right. And whatever that looks like. But this, it, when we, when we, st I think when I hear or when I feel, when I see or when I talk to guys, you know, I've, I've, I've really tried to focus on this for about 12 years now and trying to, what is going to help, like what, what is going to, what is going to enable my friends to stop killing themselves? That, that's, that's the problem set. How do we get guys to stop killing themselves? Period. End it. It's right there where we start. And it's like, all right, well, what is what is the buds course to feel for your child? What is what is, you know, what is Ranger School for anger management? Mm -hmm. Right? The structure that we're used to, which which forges us into the operator that can manage those things. Well, prior to Doc and, and his colleagues writing that paper and coming up with this idea, everybody was doing it, trying to figure it out on their own. And this really, really, I think, convoluted structure of veterans charities and, and maybe some poor assistance from the VA, you know, here's a handful of meds and you know, oh, you've got PTSD. Well, I don't have any remorse for anything I ever did, mm. but you've got PTSD. Here's your money. Go away. Type mentality. So there's no structure. There's no curriculum, if you will. And I think with, with, with Chris being able to frame this out now, it's like, all right, how do we, how do we get guys to do focused reps that they're not in that, 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 I don't want to call it, it's not a flail state, right? It's, it's a, um, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's being unsure. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not knowing specifically, not having somebody give me rut, you need to go A, B, C, D, and E. All right, check Raj, I can do that. There's nobody doing that. And then in particular, as we're focused on serving other people to give ourselves that post-mission, post, -mission, post 
service mission, the real mission needs to be the service we give to ourselves to what to 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 adapt to the to the challenges we have, get the help we can because that's the real key that I hope people take out of this book and what what Doc's work's doing is hey, there's a way to treat all of these mm, things. That is, that's the good news. That's right. And, and that's, that's right. You know, the, the point there's here is a program. The mm. point here isn't to be just say, to spread a message of pain and hopelessness, but there there are many good things that that can be done. Un, unfortunately, um, the VA is not really uh, the VA has the hits the easy button of PTSD most of the time, and doesn't really go much deeper. Than that, and and one could question whether they're even treating PTSD effectively. I don't think they are, you know, at at the at the broader level. But there we have so many um, uh, lifestyle and medical approaches that 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 are available now, and it's a matter of figuring out kind of how to prioritize and structure and find those treatments. Mm-hmm. Um, that that still even today, most people don't. You ever heard about stellate ganglion block therapy? Absolutely. You yeah. have heard of it. Good. Yeah, yeah. Good. Have you received it? Uh, no, but I've, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I helped a, a startup a few years ago, uh, like get their kind of start funding because I, I read the research around it. Awesome. Awesome. And I, I felt it was an important enough investment that they needed to make. So phenomenal. So you're already ahead of most VA mental health this professionals. Is, I mean, th- this is the primary purpose. So like, my my primary driver in life is quite literally like the hierarchy of things that I, I care about. Like the, the entire purpose of the company is this, which is, you know, I might not be the most articulate guy in the world, but at least you can see some of the things I've done that have directly helped me be able to plug in. And, you know, I built a team room because I knew I couldn't transition out of one. Okay, great. I built my own company culture because I couldn't live within what I felt were the illogical constraints of wokeism because it prioritizes bullshit when I I can't prioritize that bullshit. Mm -hmm. Like I have to prioritize my peer group and building a successful culture around the things that we care about. Like my guys, a good example of this is like, I know people like me, we can't go to a corporate institution and feel like we can have these open conversations um, the way that you can have them here, right? Like for me, I can have a, a, a team room type conversation in Black Rifle Coffee. And this isn't by any stretch of the imagination a, a commercial for us. It's hmm. the reason that I built it that way was because we're not meant for public consumption. We're not politically correct. We will, we will hit multiple tripwires in that type of culture and we will get blown up in a second because we will say something fucking ridiculous that is the most on PC. You can't take a guy, and this is one of my biggest kind of complaints that I will get a little bit passionate about. You can't take a guy that was doing the most politically incorrect profession on planet earth, which is taking fucking life of bad dudes and then roll them into Goldman Sachs next week. No, it's not going to work. And I'm just saying it from, Mm -hmm, from, uh, mm -hmm. it can work in what I would say is a subset of data. It can, but that is what I would say is a statistical anomaly because the broad percentage of guys are there in case of war. Break glass, break, gl- break glass guys. And <laughs> they got to have these conversations where a good friend of mine, you guys know him probably, um, and a lot of these guys, like they say crazy shit and it makes sense to me. And more importantly, a lot of it is super funny. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it, would, it would hit like a lead balloon anywhere else. That's right. uh-huh. It would hit right. like a lead balloon anywhere That's else. Right. You'd be like, oh, and so you, for for a big part of that, it's like scratch off the list where, you know, get guys in, get them into a culture that's supportive and encouraging. More importantly, they feel safe. Yeah. Right. 
you you cracked a code on something that that I think is has, has not been cracked very often. And and the way I the way I can if if I could if I may just to reframe what you're saying a little differently for 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 other people, I think that society which hasn't paid attention to the war doesn't know most people in our society don't know a veteran. Yeah, they get they get to board airplanes early and we thank them for their service. Super cool. Which yeah. is amazing and nice awesome. Part. Yeah. And but most people have no idea what it mm. meant. They have no idea what you did, what you did, what your brothers and sisters did. And so there's this massive indifference. There's an expectation or a belief that sure you went you went and you did some hard work and you're affected and you probably have PTSD and maybe you'll snap someday, but good thing the VA has you. And so it's not something that we really need to think about. And the idea of what we call transition, and what I use that word myself, I don't think it's possible to transition fully back to being a civilian because you can't erase your, who, who you are. You can't erase who you've been. So this, this idea that society expects you to just take off the uniform and become just like everybody else is ludicrous. It's just frankly ludicrous and it's harmful because it's giving, it's sending you a message of what you're supposed to do, which doesn't actually make sense and isn't even possible. It's not possible. And to your point, I think it's, it's, it's psychologically detrimental because it even isolates people further and makes them think that there's something broken and wrong. Whereas creating a culture where you can build an institution around, we understand. That's right. We got it. And and more importantly, you have to be able, and I've, I've had this conversation a few times where you have to be able to have those conversations in boardrooms when you're talking to, you know, Clint Trial or one of the other, we'll reference 12 other veterans in the organization where they're talking about, you know, a gunfight or, something that happened to them and they don't feel like they're going to be judged over an action that took place 15 years ago Mm -hmm. and that you're going to make other people in the organization feel uncomfortable because, you know, you, you shot a guy 15 years ago and you're having that, you're remembering and having this open form of communication about that event. Well, tell Evan what you commonly hear with guys that are like, okay, I'm identifying there's issues. I know I mm. need to get in. Mm-hmm. I go and I sit with the 27-year-old mm. master's grad in sociology. Explain what you hear quite a bit. Well, a, a very common story um, experience that guys describe to me, and I hear it over and over again, is they go to, they go to see a therapist, and they're, they're told you have PTSD, you're going to come to therapy, and you're going to talk. And we're going to have, we're going to do therapy and they get in there and they start talking. And the next thing they know, the therapist is curled up on a ball yes. on the floor, sobbing, sobbing. And, the, and, the, and the, the veteran or the responder is like, whoa, okay, I'm so sorry. Sorry, I hurt you. Sorry, I upset you. And I'm just going to go now. And they tiptoe out the room and they never come back. That's that that that's my that's my exact experience. Okay, my exact experience. Yeah. personally, yeah. personally, yeah. personally. Okay. And it's not they weren't crying, but you have to feel. You have to be able to talk, and you don't feel there's there's a line. Yeah, where you can judge from the other person on the other side of the table where they're willing to go and where they're not willing to go. Yeah, or and don't want to go. One hundred percent terrified. They're terrified, terrified, terrified to go because they're sitting on the other side of the table from you know a person that they are going to look like this person is a monster, and like we live, eat, and breathe within that community every day, and we know that we're like collectively we're not monsters. We're given a very very difficult task that has been given to men for thousands of years. Right. And, you were given a, a task, a job that our society collectively dem- in this country democratically said said go do this and then need, they, we sent you need this. This. we need you, you to do you, this you have to protect us we need you to go do this now you're going to volunteer multiple times over you're going to dedicate your entire life quite possibly your life limb or eyesight everything you know 
to this one thing of protecting your community and then you're going to be judged. Mm. More importantly, you're going to be ostracized and judged for your actions that they ultimately approved and supported. Mm -hmm. It's it. So that to me, when that, this was like way back, right? This was 2005 ish where my wife and I were going through or not to, to the, uh, the time we were going through some problems and there was no way <laughs> there was no possible way that that therapist was mm. going to be able to help mm. in any way because I didn't have post-traumatic stress. Like my friend would just, my friend, most had just operators been, don't, my friend was just cut in half by an ID. I just, just buried him. My, my, my best friend in the world, the guy that is my roommate, my, mm -hmm. my best friend in the world. And then my, my like literally my the other guy in my universe my second best friend was like same thing so within a few months these guys were literally torn down and sent home in boxes and i'm having this conversation i don't have stress i have anger and more importantly i have like what you know, survivor's, survivor's guilt, guilt. Mm -hmm. and more importantly i want fucking vengeance mm -hmm. and the only thing that will help me is to plug back into that network and go take it back, right? Like I want, I want to take it back. So you take from me, I'm going to take from you. And for me, that was like the only, the only driving factor, which was let's get back in. Let's figure out how we can go take our blood back. And that's the only thing that consumed me. It wasn't PTS. It wasn't mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. oh no. Mm -hmm. it was like, no, how do I go get it on? There's, <laughs> and, and, you know, you, you led with this takes place for thousands and thousands of years. And it's taken place in our country for thousands and thousands of years. And, and you know, if you're part of the warrior class, the ability to plug back in is the, the, the way to manage it, right? And as dysfunctional as that is, it's the cycle that we talked when we led off this conversation. But, you know, I just want to read this really quick as an example of that those stories will never go anywhere. The feeling you get a little distance from it, but it's still there. And it's still the, 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 the relationships you still had. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. John Donne. That's John Donne. That that's an old poem, hundreds of years old. Yeah. And, and, and the, the reason I wanted to read that is <laughs> there's, there's a romanticism about the idea of it that pulls us in. And then we get to experience it, and the idea shifts. It's no longer romantic. It becomes the harsh nature of, of, of how human beings savage each other. And someone's got to do it, and we roger up for it, and then, as you said, when when the cycle stops, because right, it's not a it's not an old man's game. And when you're no longer needed, or you phase out, or whatever happens, and you roll out of that system, you know now you're left to your own accord to figure out how to get off the island. Mm -hmm. And and I think it's critical for guys. And even if women are, are, are that have been involved, like you know, you had Joe Ken on recently, mm -hmm. and and the loss of his wife, you know, Shannon. Shannon is, I mean, you know, my buddy Scotty was with her when yeah. when, when they died, and and you know, that, that's that's never going anywhere. So how does how does how do all those involved, all the the ripple effect of relationships? How do how do the the people that have the memories of their best friends being torn in half. What is the structure to rehabilitate that? What are the, the very specific actions 
the, the curriculum that we can then go to and reinforce if we don't have the team room. Because that's, you know, I remember when you were coming up with the concept and I'm like, dude, that's, that's visionary. That's insane. That's like the most simplistically perfect idea that will create uh, what is not available. I remember when, when you were doing Twist Rate, we would talk mm -hmm. about, all right, how do we build the community again? Because like VFW is irrelevant, American Legion, Ambet. So all these places are no longer welcoming us in. So how do you do it? And, and you did this. You know, I, there are thousands, as you, you know, I know, everybody knows, there are thousands and thousands of guys that, that just, they don't know where to go. They don't have a team room. They don't have a system. They don't know where to look, what to do, and how to start. And I think, you know, <clears throat> Chris's work that's resulted out of this is, is somehow is like, I think in my mind, what operator syndrome is, is not this negative connotation that you're, you're permanently whatever, which we already have to manage anyways, but it's more so it's, 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 Hey, no, this is the way you reinvest. Mm -hmm. You get back into circulation. You can get back on the battlefield of life per se. Well, it's, it's interesting from like listening to this and then looking at like what you're talking about because so many of, of the guys that I know and have talked to over the course of the last 10 years, they don't know how to re-inject themselves, but they're so powerful. That's mm -hmm. the thing that I, I'm like, guys, you're, you're, you have so much discipline so much drive you have so much value in the the va and i'm not going to mud suck the va i'll just tell you my perception of it which is one there's a significant what i think is there's there's not an encouragement to go for a combination of reasons because if you go and you try to seek help uh there's a certain amount of shame like there's something wrong with me, right? Like, I, but if you have an injury, it's easy. If you're going through mm -hmm. something else, mm -hmm. that's a little bit more difficult because now that's admitting, especially from our community, you're admitting weakness. Weakness is not frowned upon, it's devoured and eliminated. So now if you're getting out of a subculture that you've been in for two decades, and now you expect to go get help by admitting that there might be something wrong or you have weakness. Now you're already probably at a point where this is so acute, you don't have any other options. That's right. And then there's a perception of incompetence. So they're not going to be able to fix me either way. So now it's a perception of incompetence and then it's identifying weakness, which is already a a significant drawback to going to get help. So then there's two things that are working against the guys that are trying to go like seek help, which I think is one of the reasons why some of the nonprofits are easier to go to because, and that's, that's part of the mission with some of these, which Hunter seven is a good example. Excellent. Example. Try to make it cool. And that's like part of what I try to do is like, make it cool. Like guys go get a cancer screening. They'll pay for it. Like they got cool designs you know, put them on a UFC mat, like make it cool. Like don't make it shameful. Make it be like part of the whole thing of like, that's right. make it a brand that's like associative, makes it cool to go and get a cancer screening. It's okay. Right. And it's, I call it like a gateway. That's right. It's like if I can, yep. if we can get you in there to get, do right. the screening. That's right. Maybe, maybe we, can, maybe we can feed you into this other thing where it's like, Hey, how much you drinking? Like you diving into a bottle every night, maybe, hey, well, yeah. maybe not do that. You know, I've always found sleep has been the gate, been the gateway I've tried to leverage because we all want to sleep better. Yeah, and guys, sleep sleep is for shit. So if you can help a guy sleep better, he's gonna he's gonna engage. He's gonna listen. He's gonna yeah. engage in some of the other ideas that you have. Um, I know after this episode airs, I'm gonna get hundreds of emails uh, from guys asking me, "What do I do? What's this? What what what's yeah. the?" What's the formula? Do you mind if I just please read right from my book? Not mm -hmm. not literally read, but 
on page 191, I have a sort of a generic treatment plan that I'll just rip through. Um, get your blood test, get your uh, hormones checked, get your hormones checked, um, get your metabolic functioning checked, test for heavy metals, test for parasites, get a polysomnography, a sleep study. Um, that will help figure out what kind of sleep issues you've got, including sleep apnea. Treatments I recommend you consider I'm not saying these are appropriate for every single person, but these are some things to consider. Stellate ganglion block, one-time treatment, lowers the anxiety massively, at least for three to six months. Ketamine infusion therapy, cognitive behavioral psychotherapy, if you can find a therapist who you can relate to, which is going to be hard. Um, couples counseling for your family, if, if need, need be. Pain management cons consultation. We now are, we're seeing, so I do a lot of work with Seal Future Foundation and we're sending guys left and right to some of the regenerative medicine clinics mm -hmm. uh, in the US and they're getting great, we're getting, we're seeing great results with the joint pain that every operator has. Headache and migraine consultation and treatment. Consider psychiatric medications. Usually I say if you're going up, a, if you get prescribed more than two psychiatric medications, it's time to put a pause on something there or get a second opinion. You might need two or three, but um, if it goes beyond that, sleep hygiene therapy. Uh, there's a, it, it's, it's, it sounds kind of silly, but, but a lot of us need to be reminded and to learn the, the do's and the don'ts, so the habits to formulate before we go to bed. Um, maybe neuropsychological cognitive testing, uh, neuroimaging, um, brain, just, you know, really getting that full brain checkup. Um, and of course, reduce or eliminate entirely alcohol, recreational drugs, tobacco. Um, then on the lifestyle side of things, consider, um, you know, take up an anti-inflammatory diet and lifestyle. Mm. Everything you do to reduce chronic systemic inflammation is going to be good for you. Mm. Uh, even, even something like hot sauna bathing, they've done, there's now randomized medical trials showing that hot sauna bathing three times a week for like 20 minutes is a powerful antidepressant in addition to lowering your the inflammation in your body. Take vitamin D, take turmeric supplements, et cetera. Um, some other treatments that are absolutely worth looking into and considering, because you may need them, are speech pathology therapy, uh, the transcranial magnetic stimulation, specifically the MERT version, which is magnetic electronic resonance therapy, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, um, I've already mentioned regenerative medicine approaches, vestibular therapy, which is essentially physical therapy for your inner ear, can help with the vertigo and disequilibrium symptoms, and also psychedelic medicines. You, you mm -hmm. mentioned psilocybin. I work with a number of foundations that will use that, ayahuasca, ibogaine, 5-MeO-DMT, mm -hmm. and there's good protocols for, for these uh, medicines, some of which you can get. Psilocybin, I think, will be mainstream in the U.S., in the, in, within a few years, right? Um, with FDA approval, the others I think are going to be coming along five or ten years later. But but we're seeing really good, and this is anecdotal, really almost miraculous results with a like for example, the mission within does ibogaine and five meo DMT uh, back to back two consecutive nights, ibogaine one night, five meo DMT the next night. And now there's research from like Stanford and John Hopkins and other places that, that are coming out really showing the benefits of, of those interventions. Um, and then, of course, other things, meditation, lifestyle, journaling. Um, many people find faith is really mm -hmm. meaningful and helpful. So there is so much that, that is out there if you look for it and find it. And so for anybody who's about to write me an email asking me, what do I do to help? That, that's the list of of some things to look at and consider. Well, and, and I've, I've found like going through that list, I've found a lot of that. Like I've, I've either done or I currently do or, and it's, and it's really, it's, it's, it's like sleep is it like the cornerstone for me at least. Right. So it's like the cornerstone of the building block of your entire day or your week is sleep. If you can't sleep. True for all of us. Right. And like that's been one thing like I, I've had to invest a ton of time and energy in, you know, there's lots of books out there. Like one is just called sleep, <laughs> like, <laughs> literally. Uh, and 
sleep hygiene, like building a place that you can sleep where, you know, I have blackout curtains and noise machines and I've invested in, in a good bed that has a cooling mattress and all this other shit. Because if I don't have, if I don't have a good night's sleep, the next day is a train wreck of a day. It's just a train wreck. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I know that at least about myself where, okay, I got, I have to get up and I have to work out, right? I have to get up and I have to work out regardless of how the sleep goes, which is always kind of like every night when I go to bed, I'm like, oh. <laughs> yep. all right, here we flip go. a coin, like, yep. here we go. I don't know how this is going to go yep. because if you got pain somewhere, right, yep. and you're going to be woken up three or four or five times, depending on the night, depending on your back or your shoulder or your whatever's going on, that's going to wake you up. And like, man, all of that list that you just used outlined, anti-inflammatory diet. I got Lyme's disease a few years ago from a turkey hunt in, our, in uh, Missouri. And I had to change my entire diet because I, I had, uh, it's called alpha gal. So it's the strain that makes you allergic to red meat specifically. Oh, so I had man. to eliminate mm -hmm. red meat. I had to eliminate all sugars and like carbohydrates. I had to go to basically meat vegetables and limited fruit that's basically my diet because mm -hmm. if i don't i i get really bad inflammation mm -hmm. yeah. and so you know alcohol it, alcohol is like that that's been alcohol gone for years. fucks everything up fucks everything sleep, up sleep inflammation it, it's so bad yeah and guys use it as a self-medicating thing and, and this is not meant as a as a judgment to towards those guys that are listening to to the podcast saying like if you drink, you're a bad guy. Like I'm just saying, if you if you work hard to take it out of your life completely, somebody, it will change your life. Somebody once said you can't cold plunge your way out of a bottle of Jack Daniels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Somebody, That's my, that, somebody that, once said that. That, that should once be said that. Evan's new BRCC shirt, right? Can't. You can't cold plunge your way out of a you know, it, it, a it, It's funny. I you know, I see the guys and they and they're 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 listening to Huberman, which I would highly encourage guys to listen to. And they're doing all this stuff. And then you watch them do like seven shots. And you're like, why are you doing all that stuff? Like take yeah. that one and chop that out. And then do all that stuff also, right? Do all the cold plunging and working out and manage your diet. And like, because if you're doing all that stuff because it's a vanity thing and you just want to look good, that's one thing. But if you feel good, that's going to be a totally different game. What, what, what made you start seeking it out though like and where did you know to look i didn't know where to look i i'm just trying i was trying to solve my own problems like i i sleep for shit like i still sleep for shit right i'll go through a good month where i'm sleeping on a regular cycle and i feel good but then i'll have like two months where just the wheels fall off the bus and i get like four or five hours of sleep a night mm. it's horrible and that getting out and then starting a business, I got four and a half hours of sleep a night for years. Like that's, I just wake up and it just kept catching up with me. Like I felt like I was in ranger school for like forever, every, forever yeah. right? You're just a zombie walking through life and everything is harder, right? Like your, your workouts are harder. Your food discipline is harder. Your anger issues and emotion you're you know learning all these things it's just so much there's so much more difficult so like the yeah you know, i can't take ambien like it doesn't do it doesn't do me any good like it, it and i've i've tried other things either prescribed or non-prescribed just doesn't do it doesn't work prescription medications might help you feel like you're sleeping they might help you not be as conscious while you're laying there in the middle of the night but they're gonna they're gonna mess up the quality of your sleep by mm. changing the pattern of slow wave and and REM sleep. So they're they're real. They're not good for any kind of long term use. No, it, and you have to work at it. That's the, that's the other thing that I've I've tried to tell guys is like you you have to train at sleep like you train at everything else. Yeah, it used to come right. easy. That's right. It used to come easy. I could sleep in a shipping container. After being out all night, mm -hmm. like, about about like on a helo going <laughs> yeah, yeah. to sleep uh, anywhere, uh, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, like lift off, <laughs> <laughs> like sleeping right. in the back of a truck. That's yeah, right. Like, that's right. Dude, oh man, this is great. Right. Yeah. 
you get full REM sleep <laughs> and then it's no, you have to you have to change everything That's about right. it because your life is is different. Then you have to throw a couple kids in the mix, oh. then you're waking up in the middle of the night as you're you know, maybe you got the bottle duty or, or your, you know, kids are co-sleeping or however, however your, your setups are with your, your kids, they're interrupting your sleep. You get a, get a new business. That's like a colicky baby to begin with. <laughs> so it's like having two of them, that's right. <laughs> right, right. Stacked on top of each other. And, you know, what I always tell guys is like, I'm, I'm running my machine in the red, like all the time. Right. My, my RPMs are pinned. Yep. Yep. That's that's a good, really good analogy. Yeah. I use that analogy myself a lot. It, it, and every day is like, especially when you're managing a business, it's like every day is like your Olympics. Every day is your day that you have to get up and you have to like run the best race of your life. And if you're not training for that day and building the building blocks around your day to be competitive, you're setting yourself up to fail, come in last. And... For me, like one, I'm, I'm hyper competitive, which is, you know, it's good and it's bad, right? It's like competitive to a fault at times where kind of grinds you. Focused your... obsession. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good. <laughs> it's a good way to put it, right? It's like being hyper competitive and I've, I've worked on it because I don't, I don't in, enjoy it. Like I, I don't enjoy it. There are things I like. this anymore? I, no, there are things I like about it, but it, when you're this obsessive about certain things, yeah. it like consumes you, and then it's like all you can think about, and you're like, it's it can be detrimental to other aspects in your life, to include your family and all these other trickle down. So you, the discipline of trying to be as competitive as you can within this box, and then separate yourself from that box, which would be in this circumstance would be the business, and be able to firewall the business off, and then be a great dad. How do you want to define great? And great is not just being there, right? It's being present, plugged in. How do you, how do you create value for yourself and your family in a way that's like not Instagram value? That's, that's not what I'm fucking talking about. I'm saying like, how do you really build long lasting, loving relationships where you're plugged in and creating incredible people that are interesting and fun. And, and then you're yielding that result where, you see the fruits of your labor where your kids are honest and hardworking and beautiful and amazing. And you're, you know, they love you. Like the best thing in the world is like yeah. your kids come, you come home and my kids come like running out of whatever room and they like tackle you. Right. Mm -hmm. Because that to me is a sign that I'm doing something right. My kids want me to be there. They want to be like, plugged in hooked on the leg and walking around and mm -hmm. doing how much stuff. how much better do you think you could get oh because i think that's a real existential question guys mm. struggle with what do you mean by that because obviously what do you mean by better more functional yeah. right so we've we've i think guys figure out how to task themselves to drive, not necessarily improving their baseline. Mm. They're just working at the same pace that they did before with their, but they're not, they're not improving on these things. Mm. And, and that's what has really been the calling card for me lately. Cause for, since we've known each other since, since 16, and every time we talk, and we talk a lot, hey, by the way, have you gone done the sleep study? Have you gone do that? And I'm like, and you never have, never have. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I'm um, again. Yeah. I've 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 is that like avoidance? Is that what it is? I, I don't know. I mean, that's a good psychological question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's been the story of my life until I get smacked real bad. Like, I, I'm not going to change. I, but it's like I'm going to use. I'm going to keep running as hard as I can until it just breaks and I'm forced to do it. Yeah. Right. I'm not taking care of myself because I'm, I'm perpetually sacrificing for the job, you know, on the road 200 plus days a year still, you know, the intensity of all the different 
mentoring and coaching and 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 all that, starting a nonprofit, you know, all these things, and then the four girls and my family supporting the greater family, my parents who are aging. It's like, nah, I ain't got time to bleed, right? Yeah. And, and it's like, no, man, you're you think just because you're still going at the same tempo or speed, you're still good because you might go pluck out some treatment modality mm -hmm. that gives you the relief for the 30 days, for the 60 days, for the 90 days. And you're like, yeah, man, I'm good. And you've only addressed one aspect of this. And there's still a whole other core litany of things that you're, that, that are in conjunction with that mm -hmm. yet you can get. But again, you, you don't want to come off the, the proverbial hamster wheel because you know, if you do, you slow down and then you start feeling everything. Mm. You start really feeling the pain and the joint pain. You start really feeling, hey man, you know, I, the headaches are getting worse and worse. I mean, last year I got to a place where I was getting two, three a month. Whereas before I'd get a migraine once every three to four or five months that would put me down. Mm. And now I'm getting three a month and it's like, what are you doing about it? And yeah, I know. And I know. And meanwhile, I'm out there preaching, Hey man, have you gone and done this? Have you got, you know, call mama Lee for hyperbarics. Have you gone hundred and seven to get a cancer screening? Hey, are you, have you gone to warrior's heart mm. because you're drinking like a, a handle a day or all these satellite. And I think the, the challenge that I feel myself and that I've also heard from other guys is that's a big fucking list. And there's a lot of things and there's no one place that exists in the country at all. Mm. Cause I've been looking for the last 12 years. Mm. I've looked far and wide at it cause friends keep dying. So I keep searching where the thing is. And, and there's no one place that collectively ties all that together. Now, certain organizations the Seal Future Fund, they're really getting a, a better scale and, and, and intake. And I think there's some other organizations. That, yeah. If I could just put yeah, in, a, just mention the Seal Future Foundation just launched a website earlier, well, about two or three weeks ago. Goodness, I'm a little discombobulated in time. It was last week. Mm. And it's an educational resource that they that lives on the Seal Future Foundation's website, but it's available to everybody. So um, I hope I hope my book, our book, um, I had a lot of help writing this book. By the way, there's a lot of operators and spouses whose words are are represented in it. The Seal Future Foundation website um, is something that we, a, a, a large multidisciplinary group of us, um, there our our health board of advisors for Seal Future is 15 people cross disciplines and we, we meet every two months and we've spent two years working on this thing with the health team, Joey Fio, who runs the health program at Seal Future Foundation and, and Hoagie and David, and we've all put this thing together and it's up there and I think it's really a good resource. So if anybody wants to just go and look at a, you know, it's a, it's a public access, anybody can go and, and see it. And it's got a lot of information about the injuries, impairments and treatments. Uh, that are available. So yeah, there are foundations um, that are that I think are starting to really um, go deep on on a lot of the needs. I see that because I see it from there's a lot of organizations that might address one, right? That's so, right. You know, you have 17 on this list, and there's organizations that go deep on one piece of that. And to your point. I've, I've looked too. I've looked for something that's a little bit more holistic and kind of cobbled together. What I would say is a lot of these different things yeah. with different specialists. Mm -hmm. now, like I'll get my blood work done every other month. You know, wow. typically like every other month, uh, because you know, like it, it depending, right. So it's like, I'm looking for all the different things in it. That's so right. I've been, I've had to, become somewhat of a subject matter expert on where am I, where's my blood work? Like, what do I need from a panel? So I'll be telling my doctors, like, this is kind of what I need. Mm -hmm. Like you That's need, key. you need That's to what do it takes. this. That's yeah. what it takes. You got to educate your doctors. And that's part of this is like, you have to go and take control and command. And I think this will help a lot of guys be able to take command 
and develop their checklist. And if they have to cobble it together, like you mentioned the MERT, like six years ago, I was sending guys to, to go get MERT treatment in San Diego, which is Wave Neuro yep. was, the, was the company. They right. came to office and I, w- I would send guys like, hey, you're, you're, you're getting crazy. <laughs> like, like, cause the anger. So like on this list that I've seen in, in direct attributes from people that have worked with us when, you know, I had a credible guy that worked as our, uh, in, in ops with us for quite a few years. And he was just going sideways on stuff, man, just completely overboard. I'm like, dude, we're, we're selling caffeinated brown water. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we're ma- we're making dick jokes on the internet and selling caffeinated brown water. Like there's nobody's going to get blown up on this. Yeah. Like you need to kind of turn the volume down on this and searching for different resources that we can send guys to go out and do. And then part of this whole thing was uh, also leading people to do this through action, which is, you know, arrows. People were always like, why, why did you guys go so heavy into archery. It's like, because it's an active form of meditation That's right. and it, it puts you into a wilderness environment where if you're a former action guy, you can use the acronym if you wish. And if you're a former action guy, now you get to go out in the woods with, you know, a stick and a string and engage with these like wonderful animals in if you're, if you're lucky and you've worked hard and you have all this discipline throughout the year and you practice shooting and focused on targets and done all this, you've maybe hopefully been able to take an animal and that animal translates into food into your family. Your fulfillment in that small action that you think might be insignificant turns into something much bigger because now you've got a, a totally different subculture and tribe mm-hmm. that share similar values that has different interests that you might be into. It allows you to completely immerse into the wilderness and be in a quiet place, disconnected from electronics, and then also provide for your family in a way that you can sit down and share a Mm -hmm. meal. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a very spiritual activity. It's ancient. It's ancient. Yeah. And what, what, so it's like these these ounces equal pounds type of things mm-hmm. where I'm looking mm-hmm. at the list and I'm looking at the things that we're doing, saying, okay, we've built this culture around being able to 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 encourage one another to go out and pursue you know your professional endeavors outside of the military. We've turned you on to different recreations. We've addressed different therapy options. There's ways that we can do, and there always is. Like we have to do more. Like one of the things I'm looking at that list going, man, like there has to be a place that you can send somebody. Well, and that's, to, that's the, I think for, for me in the long term, um, you know, going to work for a large asset management company is comes with some unique perks in terms of who I'm exposed to right. and the, the level of wealth that I'm in front of on a regular basis. And I've had some really interesting conversations because one, most people have no concept of the magnitude of, of operator syndrome and how many guys it's affecting. They, they can't even fathom the numbers of suicides. They're like, wait, what did you just say? Why are our toughest guys, our most accomplished military personnel, why, are, why is this happening? And I say because it's too big for them to handle without a team around it mm. or whatever. And, and they're, you know... It, it, if if I get the right person who's really really believes in 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 well, that sounds courtry pa- patriotism I guess yeah. that's for lack of a better term what can I do how do I do it and what do you need and what where are the places and what what like I get all the time who should I donate to mm-hmm. who where should I put my money and it's it's very difficult and i you know i've got a few that i drive pe- to people towards hunter 7 mm-hmm. i drive people towards sff i you know to warrior's heart tom's place and yeah. you know some ones that That's i know program. that that i know work that i've I, friends have gone to and it's worked but but they're like no 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 where where's the main center yeah where's the place yeah. right and and i'm like there is none and they're like well, why hasn't some you know why hasn't you know uh, you know, some large Baptist health or HHC or some huge hospital corporation, 
gotten into this and built this facility? And, and the answer is, I don't know. And I think, I think there's, unfortunately, within, to, to, to make it in terms of current events, where America is so inundated with an order of problems that we're not seeing, that it's, it's like, oh, who, who are those, those guys from 10 years ago? Mm. And, uh, you know, they're all right. The VA's taking care of them. Yeah. They're getting, they're all right. And, and it's just not the truth. And, and so it's like, all right, how do we get people focused to say, let's look at the, the magnitude, even if you don't want to use the term operator syndrome and, and, and he won't admit it, but I'll admit it there. There's pushback on this term, mm. significant pushback. They do not want they being, I think people in the military, people in other government organizations, they do not want this to be the moniker of uh, or, or the result of what they asked us to do they don't want this affiliated why no one will want to join and i was like you got other problems why people don't want to join or, the intention behind this is not to distract change alter training uh even whatever it's just saying hey listen if you're going to ask uh, a, a a group of people to 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 for 20 years to take 80 plus percent of the workload and some guys, this guy, Derek, 27 combat deployments, 20 fucking seven. That's a staggering reality. How are you not going to tell me we owe them something? And I, and it's not like owe them a debt of gratitude. Right? No, let's just help them get to improve. Let's help them. Let's create a, uh, you know, we've, and, and this is the argument, and I know I'm kind of bouncing around. The argument is all veterans are, deserve focus. Anybody that serves, right? In particular, any veteran that went overseas or whatever. But my, my thing is, you, BUDS, Selection, Ranger School, MARSOC, what, whatever, you know, PJs, that's a different level than boot camp. And I, you know, the, the, yeah. it was fascinating discussion you had with Joe about boot camp. I thought it was really interesting. It's just not the same, it's not. right? And then, and then the deployments—they're just not the same. And so, what you're telling me is, you, you, what you achieved, and we could do a whole other show of what was and wasn't achieved on the last twenty years. <laughs> yeah, go down that road, but but we, but we still did it. And some of us, some of them, a lot more than others too. Why is it so difficult to just create a space like, like Fort Bragg or wherever where people can come in? And 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 the challenges is, yeah, I know you're busy with keeping guys on the line. Then figure out how we can do it to where we create a space that's not for active. It's for veterans to come in do regular checkups, to get hyperbarics, to get MRIs, to do uh, hormone therapy, all under the same roof, the same place, the same thing. You know, is, is that a $2 billion project? No, it's a, it's a $35 million, potentially $50 million structure because of the, the, the medical equipment and, lice and the doctors and whatever, mm -hmm. whatever. But why not? Because if you, if, and this is the thing that we were talking about, and this is, and I'm not going to put you on your spot, but I, I, I've been asked many, many times over the last couple of years, especially post Afghan pullout, would you want your children to go into special operations or the military? Right. I, you know, I have four daughters. So, and I, and I'm, I'm like, no, absolutely not. And it's not because I don't want them to serve or serve their country. It's because the next one is, is going to, could be, 10 times what we went through. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't think it's about the next one. I think it's about the last one. Good point. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, th th and thank you the, for not just the, um, not just the experience of the last one, but more so the, the aftermath yes. and the lack of, of perceived, the lack of appropriate care to the injuries mm -hmm. uh, that we're talking about. Yeah. I, I think it's, I think it's I think it's a, a sad state where you know there 
they're not willing. <laughs> I say they, right? It's like the 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 yeah. they, right? The the institutions when we started, they this, know who they are. Yeah, they, that's the they, not, that's the thing. That's the truth. They do they know. You know, it was you know, the flags were on the back of cars. You know, they were you know veterans needed. You know, to get people in to serve, they were talking about you know college and paying for college and there were all these like very patriotic initiatives. And then after a decade or so, the things start winding down and then they start trimming back on the different initiatives. And a lot of people joined with this notion that they're going to not only serve, but then they're going to come back and be able to transition back into civil, civilian life. And the, the politicians, <laughs> like I hate using terms like this, but mm-hmm. it's like, our political institution would take care of them. And I think the, the the glaringly obvious failure is even the lack of desire. There's not even what I feel is the, the appropriate amount of desire. There's more desire to try to figure out um, uh, how not to offend people that use pronouns than there is to go and say, and I, the, like, and I don't really give a shit what people are into. Yeah. I'm just saying my thing is we sent thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people were deployed over the last 20 years. Tens of thousands of special operations guys were deployed. Tens of thousands of infantry, you know, Marines and in, in light infantry and airborne infantry and special operations guys. Like we, they, they carried the heaviest rucksack and the, the lack of willingness for us to take care of that what that does is it shows the the rot of where I feel. Yeah, it, it's bureaucracy, but it's also it, where where are the ethics associated oh, with this in our society? Yeah. There, there's a forcing function where there's these side conversations that take place every day that are on CNN and Fox, everywhere, all the time. And then it's, a conversation around like, oh, here's the, you know, special operations guy, so-and-so, and look at how cool he is. You know, you parade him around like, like, a, like, like some circus freak, <laughs> mm-hmm. for a lack of a better term. Mm-hmm. Well, what we need is not to be paraded around on Veterans Day talking about how grateful we are Memorial on these different, yeah, Memorial Day. 9-11. It's, hey, you need substantive change where people can plug into to the system and remind remind the taxpayers like these are the things that we have to fund these are the things that are really important for us to help define what a healthy society is that's right like it, it, it it's a lack of def- defining clearly what a healthy society is just because you disagree with the war doesn't mean you can just disconnect from the responsibility of taking care of the people that actually deployed it's un, it's unfortunate but it's the reality like i get it not everybody agreed with iraq that doesn't mean you just get to opt out and say fuck it like we we don't have any moral responsibility to what's going on or what's happening to the veterans and because i think it's cool i'm part of the i'm i'm i'm, I'm part of the solution no the solution is we got it really plug in and help people like really plug in and real solutions not here's some fucking sleeping aids and some anti-inflammatories and you know it, it, by the way it irritates the shit out of me where i talk about people and they're and I'll, I'll pause here for a second but it's like taking veterans on a fly fishing trip <laughs> is not a solution that's that's not what we're talking about it's like it has to be substantive and create gravity That doesn't do it. It disconnects them from reality for 72 hours. They get to throw flies in a river. Congratulations, hip, hip, hooray. We all did did something for vets. No, it's more meaningful. It's much deeper. And let's remember, the VA does have a $13 million, $13 billion mental health care program. $13 billion. $13 billion billion from last year. Billion. 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 But they don't offer most of the treatments that that I just read off. They don't pay attention to hormones. They don't pay attention to chronic pain very well. 
it, it just seems like we could take some tiny little speck of that 13 <laughs> right. billion and redirect that and make that, you know, a, you know, put that to to use for people who are really, you know, have these complex injuries and who sacrificed so much for all of us. For all, I, all of all of you guys sacrificed and and people like me have been the the beneficiaries. I am not relying on them. No. anymore. No. I can't, mm. can't do it. It's, it's, I've been let down. I've had too many conversations yeah. and, and don't get me wrong. There are certainly, there are soft guys in Congress. There are soft guys. That are, they're doing something here, something there, but, but you know, they're, they're not coming together and acknowledging the magnitude of it in the way I would hope potentially if, if I were to become run for office, that I would want to do it, right? Mm -hmm. right? This would be a seminal thing. Let's help my brothers that are killing themselves. It's just not going to happen. There's other things, other for whatever reason, it's just not, I'm not, I have no faith. What I believe it takes place is we are going to save ourselves. No one is co coming to save us other than ourselves. Yeah. And that's why I have hope and I am, uh, you know, you know, Old, old rut and trying to you know find the motivational aspect of, of of the situation you exist and brcc exists and you're focused on it right so your future found knows it exists and focus on it uh, uh kevin lace is focused on it right um dr mulvaney he's focused on it there's other people out there that are focused on this the the challenge is, is how do we how do we bring our resources together and and solidify the 30 40 different charities that are right. focused on these specific things and doing really well in their one thing and creating a space and a system a program yeah. a checklist a mission an op order for guys to take place and i think you know that's the strategy we build the op tempo to to seek out the treatment modalities that we know to work to get guys back on their feet, get them in that 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 space where they're feeling the momentum because that's all it takes, I believe. Instead of the inverse momentum where you go in, you get the woman or whoever curled up in the ball hearing the crazy stories, or going into the VA and you know trying to explain blast wave injury and they're right. like you know that's not it it's coming to a space hey this works this is the the focal point in in in, in creating a system mm -hmm. that works because it's it's the work is is done and there i think it's now there's a framework we just have to police that together and then figure out how to be the team sergeant or the master chief or the chief for the guy that is feeling the shame and 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 is 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 on the the hamster wheel. Mm -hmm. No, no. Here come I'm going to send you down to hyperbarics. I'm going to send you to Mexico and and we're going to keep pushing you forward until you get into the rhythm, the battle rhythm of healing and then you're going to get there. Right. Well, that's a good spot to pause. I'm going to go use the bathroom might going to be the second half of this, which is we've identified what I would say is, a, you know, the checklist and you've talked a little bit about your book, but let's, let's just say you're King for a day. Yep. Right. I, I, I want to, I want to like just have some hypothetical conversations around what are real solutions that if you had the keys to the castle, like how would you change the way the system is? And I'm not talking about the VA. I'm talking about the entire just system the entire specific. System. Yeah. And then, like I'll just throw you the keys. What what are real solutions if you're the king? Well, I think you do have to start with VA, and you have okay. to start with policy. With my, you know, being keys to the kingdom, I would essentially radically redesign the VA to to do away with most of its brick and mortar, bricks and mortar, and mm -hmm. most of if and and most of the federal um, workforce. And turn, essentially, give everybody who needs a, a card 
you know, that, that magic coupon to go get the treatment that they need from wherever they can find it. That would be one thing. So right now the VA is run primarily, the mental health service is, prim, is, is predominated by psychology and psychiatry. Mm-hmm. And, and what's the main difference between the two? Oh, psychology is, so, so I'm a psych, clinical psychologist. Mm-hmm. I don't have, I'm not a, I don't have an MD. I have a PhD. I, I don't, have any medical school background, I cannot prescribe medications. So psychiatrists are, are, are people who that went and got went to medical school and then specialized in psychiatry afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, so they prescribe, psychiatrists prescribe most medication, psychologists are usually therapists, mm-hmm. along with social workers. Uh, I've, we, we're seeing, I think, to reasonably good effects, nurse practitioners and PAs also are, are in, in the mix, and they can prescribe, and, and they do pr- do some therapy. Um, I think part of the problem right now is the, the woke ideology of medical schools and training programs for all of the allied health. One, one of the things that, I, that I'm hearing a lot lately is um, from operators that go and get these, de- that get a health degree, and then go to the work for the VA, well-intentioned and thinking that they're going to be part of the solution, and they... Uh, they get into the VA and the uh, even on the debrief or the the orientation, not the debrief, the orientation session. Uh, uh, you know, the first week of working for the VA, and they're being given training on cultural competence to work with LGBTQ populations. That's fine. L, um, racial trauma, you know, all these other things, but nothing about. But veteran none of them culture. know what a fucking seal or a green beret is. Nothing about veteran culture. Nothing about the history of, of the GWAT. Nothing about the the life and the injuries and the experiences of combat soldiers. It's it's so interesting. Like I, I've said this like multiple times, but this is the, you're hitting the nail on the head from one of my biggest frustrations from this entire conversation around woke ideology and their focus on like this small. I th- I think I, I pulled the data on how many. Uh, soldier, sailors, airmen, or Marines actually went through a, a, a DOD-sponsored uh, gender reassignment surgery. It was like 11. It, and, and I, 11 I the, total. Yeah. And I probably got that wrong, but let's just say it's under 50, like give or take a couple. But think about the tens of thousands of guys. Yeah, yeah. That, like, and I think about it not just not just from our guys, right? Mm-hmm. I think about the the... The, the 101st Airborne, the 82nd Airborne, the guys that were out in Hellman, the Marines out in Sangin, the, the oh, guys yes. that were living in fuck like yeah. living. The Mars like, push. Like, yeah. yeah. Like, I'm not just excluding guys saying, the hey, Kyle this. Kyle Carpenter's yeah. and his buddies. Like, th- that's, what, that's what I'm saying. Mike, you, there's all this focus. It's like national attention on this crowd of people that constitute such a small percentage and the it's overall, not, it's not small. It's vanishingly rare. <laughs> That's even better. I'm like, but my buddies, our peer group, the guys that like shit in boxes and lived on MREs and and were exposed to toxins and you know it, it, overpressure death. and explosives, and death and all this other shit, we're just cast aside. Like, oh fuck off. We don't really give a shit about you. Whereas, like, I want to your point, the cultural aspects of this that say the war fighter is our focus. That's right. The war fighter, Absolutely. the guy that was exchanging bullets downrange in the benefit of the protection of the United States, not whether or not you want to be a fucking cat this week. Like, I'm well, oversimplifying it. Yeah, so. and so for a veteran, you walk into a VA, and if you mispronoun somebody, yeah. you might get banned. You might not even be allowed to get Disarmable treatment. Disarmable discharge for <laughs> yeah. hate crime. Are you serious? There's a couple instances where people have fought back and they're being like dishonorably discharged. Well, and VAs that are denying veterans care. That's right. For 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 that same thing. You've got a bigger focus on microaggressions <laughs> than you do on combat trauma. <laughs> and, and, and just to make just to really make the point of how absurd this has gotten, how absolutely <laughs> fucking ludicrous it has become. Sorry, I'm getting worked up I here love now. It. I've got a I've got a buddy who is active duty right now at one of the tier units, and he just came back from a from a, a deployment overseas in 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 pretty austere, pretty very kinetic 
you know, location on the other side of the world. And he's now taking some, some, some classes, some master's level classes in counseling psychology. And they're sitting there telling this, this guy that, he, and he's the only guy in the class, and they're telling him that he's the problem because he's a white male. And they're lecturing about microaggressions, and he's learning all these classes about microaggressions. So here's a, here's a guy who's been, you know, at the, at the tip of the spear at a, at a highly elite tier one level, and he's being lectured about, you're the problem, and we don't want any more of your microaggressions. Microaggressions are the, are the real problem in our world, according to what he's now learning. Meanwhile, we're on the greatest, the closest precipice of World War III that we have, that we have been since the 1960s. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a cultural uh, Rome is burning type scenario, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, not to get too political because it's, it's not, that's not necessarily what this is meant to be. It's meant to be this conversation around if we were to fix things. Can, can I and, interject yeah, my, my belief in that? I, I, I believe when you look at the, the order of money invested in support programs, that's as sure. broad as I can paint it, from the S&P 500. Let's just start there. Yeah. The, the, the level of money that they dedicate towards these programs is astronomical. It's billions of dollars. Why isn't it that FedEx, why isn't it that Home Depot, and they have a veterans program. I've talked to the people. Yeah. In, well, yeah. In it. yeah. yeah. Why isn't it <clears throat> that Exxon, or you know what would be even in, in more interesting? Why doesn't Raytheon or, or Lockheed Martin or whomever that earns billions of dollars in revenue every year yeah. off sending us being overseas doing whatever it is they think we're doing or want us to do, why can't they all get together and say, you know what? Here's $50 billion, right? Evan, I want you to go out and I want you to assemble a team of, a board of 20 guys that are passionate about this. And gals. And, and, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, for sure. And then a, 20 a, team, dudes. a, a team of, of 20 Healthcare providers that are intimately in this and build us a framework, a structure up to include a facility. You pick where it is, Texas, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever it is. And, and this is a 10-year thing. Go. Why isn't that happening? Because if you do that, right, if you do that, then, then my buddy's two sons... Or, or better yet, my brother-in-law has seven, eight-year-old son who, you know, I give him the seal hats. I just yeah. gave him a pair of, of jungle boots and desert boots, little, little jungle boots. I give him my old trident patch, you know. Every time I see him, all right, let's go into water. You know, there's a part of me that's like, man, this little boy, ha we, you know, he's the future. Right. Right? But he's not going to, like, if... Unless I'm going, yeah, don't worry, they'll take care of you. He's not going to go in there. I mean, he might because yeah. his his dad <clears throat> serves, you know, his his grandfather served, I served, it's in the family. But if he's not 100% sure that the total support, you know, then then why not? But if that's there, it takes care of the other stuff. That's it. I, I really like that idea you were talking about earlier to tackle onto that, which is I like this idea of you have a and, I, and I've been thinking about it as you're talking. Um, you know, you transition out of one of these units and then you go on to like another unit almost. So you retire and you go on and then you you got you get on and you know, you know my line of work would be like the ODA, right? Yeah. So I'm a I'm on the operational detachment that puts guys into a pipeline for transitioning. So I transition out of the mill. I get into this other unit, which is basically a group of retirees. It's yes. also part of 
the DOD medical facility. It's built and organized around a special operations community. You speak the same language. And then it's like, that could be your team sergeant that you're just with. Exactly. It's also yeah. going, hey, buddy. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You're Come on. Your, you're, you're, you're still with your tribe. You're still with you your guys. That, that, that famous 14 to 36 month where you fall off that freaking cliff because you're drinking a handle a day and you're taking 25 meds and you're, you know, you're beating up your wife. Before you get there, hey, let's put you through selection for becoming whatever it, it is. It, it's almost like I think that it's almost like you need, depending on how much time that you put in, yes, you you actually need X amount of time. And what I would say is, is it within the a, what a, a transition unit? They used to have these like medical transition units. Really? Yeah, they used to have them in the war because you'd have all these guys that were getting back from the GWA, and then you you're still on active duty, and you. You have to go to, you know, check in basically every day, but you're, you know, in rehab. So I like, tore my, I tore my right, my, my right medial gastroc. Mm -hmm. And so I was in physical therapy. And so I'd have to show up to fucking PT every day that you weren't going to do. And I'd like, go to physical therapy and then, you know, Roger up. But they had entire units that were stood up to help facilitate guys that were injured and either rehab them or go back. So that, this is like high to GWAT, right? Okay. So things are ripping. And I, I'm, I'm in this frame of mind, like if I were king for the day on this, I would almost stand up a second force of guys that were completely trained and led by medical professionals, right. organized around the same type of organization structure they had before. You have screening process, medical, everything that you need. And then you also have a tryout. So if you want a job over there, when you're retiring after 22 years, you're like, hey, man, I'm going to try to go do this while I'm in transition to go be this guy. And like, you, if you think about that culturally, you'd be 100% aligned. You'd be like, that's hey, right. this is what you need to do. Because that's, that's right. your old team sergeant. That's the, that's the guy yes. that you're kicking yeah. indoors with. That's, right. that's the dude going, hey, you're going to go talk to this. You're going to talk to him. You're going to get your blood panel here. You're going to get this screening here. We're going to take you down to... You know, this facility in Texas for a few weeks, you're going to fly back. We're going to get you set up. Like, that would be so much easier for us. Like, so much easier. So much. And, and, and here's, here's the thing. I, I, and I, I want to be obviously clear on, on what I'm saying. SOCOM prepared individuals to go to war better than I think it's ever done in the history of, of war fighting. Ever been done by Ever anybody. Ever been yeah. done by anybody. 100%. And, and so th I think there, there might be an underlying fear that we're trying to alter that. No way. Because you can't. You have to have the level of exposure in order to generate the individual that can do what you're asking them to do at the level you're in the repetition that you're asking them to do it. However, we build in some modifications of long-term exposure you can't do you can't do five workups and deployments in a row no. can't do it sorry you can do three but then you got to take four years off or whatever it is to better yourself or go through this mid-career recovery program to a right. desk and, a, and all right like it's like your interruption phase at eight ten twelve years you go through this year of recovery like it's you're going to a spa for a year <laughs> Right, get your yeah. guys back up. They become better, more sophisticated. You rebuild them, right? Then they can go back do another three deployments, go back, whatever. And then as soon as they get out, they don't have to jump into civilian world immediately with a family that doesn't know them. You know, a, a spouse that's on the brink of. I mean, how many dudes do you know that were married had? Pretty decent marriages get out and got divorced within the first year. Yeah. And it's staggering, yeah. right? It is. I've seen that too. Yeah. yeah. And 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 then they go through this year rehabilit you know, recovery program to then transition into what you're doing. And and you like you said, you build the culture around it. And and you will see, you will see, I guarantee you will see all of us flip our our real the, the problems we have with this, and we will say, no, they they got it squared away. They changed, and they, they are now very considerate of what 
they're asking us to do. And then they're also very considerate of, of setting us up for success on, on the departure out. And, and it, it's like you said, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a unit. It becomes way easier, I think, to recruit people too. Absolutely. Because if you okay. know that you're going to put in a ton of work, you're going to get uh, what I'll call a combat sabbatical in mid, mid, you know, mid-20, and then you move into a transition period that could take three to five years, depending on what whatever you're the doing. Level. And then you know that what your your job is to not only professionally develop yourself, heal, professionally develop yourself, maybe add a few more things. Like one of the things that we do is like I always tell guys to come in and get a project management certificate, just PMP, because when you know how to get like right place, right time, right uniform. Yeah. You already have management and leadership skills. That history degree doesn't give you. A f- I don't give a fuck. That's great. Yeah. Like hip hip hooray. Like you know, tell me about you know the you know India Pakistan relationship <laughs> later. I don't care. I want to yeah. know. Yeah. Can you move projects from point A to point B? Can you start something like, and finish it? Yeah. That, yeah. Congratulations. I, I want to know. So even from a, a, a professional workplace integration and just moving back into civilian life and being able to, to be an asset to either a company or yourself, there are things you can put in your kit bag that will directly enhance your success professionally that it doesn't require you to go back to Columbia. You know, it doesn't. And more importantly, that might not be the greatest place for you to, to begin horrible. with. It could be fucking horrible, yeah. right? Can I be king for a day again? Please. I got three ideas that I want to put on the table. So one is just to just to acknowledge our responders again. Yeah. They don't have a VA. They got nothing. They got bupkis. So law enforcement, um, firefighters, EMTs, I think we need to bring them mm. into some kind of conversation here, into the fold, because there's just nothing there. When when JD Miller and I were looking into this, we did a, a look at the the medical literature. And so for the, the most recent year, we, and I'm thinking this was 2022, when you type, when you go to med, when you do a search of, of the medical literature and the yeah. number of articles related to veterans, there were 15,000 articles. When we did that for firefighters, 500. What? It was a 30 to 1 ratio for firefighters. Law enforcement, I think it's, it's, uh, it's 5 to 1. I believe, but it's a massive disparity and, and nothing, there's nothing there for them. And we all, we don't even know anything about them. Uh, So that's one piece. I think kind of a somewhat related idea that I would put on the table is the requirement to have some form of national service for everybody Mm. Mm. because our, our civilian society is completely detached, detached. Mm. Um, and if and so I I'm you know the Israeli model of military service for all, I think something like that could really help change the whole the whole tone and understanding of our of our country to help people understand, hey, you can be part of something bigger, and that that has a unifying effect. It has a service inculcation effect, um, and it would it would be a way of I mean it would be good for the youth of America, the yeah. young adults of America as well. But I think it would have dividends all across the board my my third idea or my third thought and this is going to go back to the va the va has set up a research system and program for itself Mm -hmm. that that prevents good ideas from outside the system from being incorporated in this in the va system so let me explain what i mean by that Prevents good ideas and the and the the competition. The VA m- minimizes the competition pool of scientists. You have to be a VA employee to apply for VA research funding. Think about that just for a moment. It doesn't so, make sense. So at when all. I when, at all. when I was a VA employee at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, I applied for both VA grants and I got them, and I applied for NIH grants and I got them. Anybody, you guys can apply for an NIH grant. Right. Um, you probably aren't going to get it unless you can, <laughs> unless you're going to show you have good science. Well, we've got some experiments we'd like to do, but I got a microwave. <laughs> I got mayonnaise. I don't know. And I got a I'm a scientist. <laughs> 
<laughs> but the VA doesn't allow the other NIH investigators. So now I can still, now I'm no longer affiliated with VA. I can still apply for NIH grants, but I'm not so sorry. I can't apply for a VA grant. That means everybody who applies for VA grants is in the system. They work for the VA. They, they know what, you know, they know what the, the, the guide rails are. Um, they know anything that might be considered, and I was told this all the time, that my ideas and my work were inconvenient to the VA. Um, they were not welcome. Um, now, I had VA grants, and, and the irony is I found those VA grants much easier to get than the NIH grants because there isn't the same competition. Mm. I mean, that, that, is yeah. the, that, is, that is kind of the nature of, of excellence is, is opening the door to competition from That's everybody. Right. Yeah. And so all of their reviewers are v, grant reviewers <laughs> are VA employees. All of their grant applicants are VA employees. All of the program managers who make the decisions about money are VA employees. It, let me ask you a question. Have you guys have you guys found or seen a what I would say is like a, a central clearinghouse for veteran resources? Like I, like I'm just in you know, and I've I've, I've loosely you know, obviously I've, I filled out my VA forms and you know did the whole thing when I got out. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm wondering is there is there a system basically that snaps in on top of 200 different nonprofits that you can type in a bunch of different things that you might be looking for. And does it like spit out basically? I don't think so. No, there is not. I don't think so. I never heard of one. No, there's been a couple people, individuals mm -hmm. who have really been determined once they saw the framework, it kind of got them focused and so they've done the rotation on the the nonprofits that provide the yeah. the specific care, and they've kind of done a bunch of them, you know, eight or nine different treatment modalities. Yeah. And and then what they've done is they've then talked to people at those locations. Hey, what do I do for this? And they've given mm -hmm. them a couple. Of, and so they've built a loose framework of programs. But the challenge is, is the donor fatigue is so substantial, right? At, at the height, there was about 46,000 veterans charities. 46,000? 46, 46,000. This is back when I was working with the Lone Survivor Foundation. Right. I was working Fif with 15,000 alone in Texas when I was there a yeah. few years ago. Uh, and, and it's overwhelming. It, it is. It's insane. And less than 15% of those were meeting the gold standards, which is 70 cents on the dollar to the veteran. And most of those were experiential, right? Yeah, it was yeah. a way for people to recreate and That's pay, right. have it paid for. That's yeah. right. You had probably, I think it was like, it was it was some minuscule, like under 1% mm -hmm. that were doing the target-specific things, right? That, hey, this is a treatment that will address your endocrine dysfunction. This is a treatment that will address cognitive impairment this is a tree you know very few and, and and the problem is is those they come online right and they can't keep the funding and so they collapse right. because there has been a, a bit of a much like what's taken place in business uh in terms of pushing out the little guys yeah uh there has been in particular in 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 our area some much larger organizations that seem to gobble up all the resources, if you will, yeah. or be more attractive. It, that's a better way to put it. Because of their their presence, because of their uh, the marketing, because of what people know in the collective consciousness of of of, of veterans charities, they're very focused. Like, oh, well, that's the place you go. But the reality yeah. is is you know, a lot of that money is not getting to these core root problems for veterans, mm -hmm. right? And and unfortunately, that's that's the challenge. So, you know, no, there is there hasn't been somebody to create kind of this epicenter of of knowledge first, and then a structure to because the hardest part, and this is what what we're hoping to accomplish 
you know, we've been working on this idea for years. It's like, all right, initially, what is the first thing guys need? Well, there's two things in my mind. First, they need to get clean and they need to get sober, mm. right? That's that's the first and foremost thing. You're not going to be able to endure this radical shift in your baseline unless you're you're clean and sober. Then the other was you 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 have to have somebody that guides you through it. Mm-hmm. You have to have somebody that holds your hand. Remember on on days where your medic would come around with, you know, whether it was uh, Mefloquine Mondays or it was, <laughs> yeah. what, which has caused insane psychosis. But that's a whole nother story. Yeah. But but you, you had to get your your shot before Japanese encephalitis. Right, yeah, we're getting ready yeah. to deploy, and you're like, psh, you're out the back door. So there's a natural reluctance for it, anyways. So it's some sort of concierge service. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's really where, where John and I and, and, and Chris are, are, are trying to develop this idea. Now, we have found and identified potentially an organiz- a group that can, has been doing something similar, but we're not sure if they have the administrative capacity to be, Evan, hey, man, I want to put you through this program, right? It's, this guy's going to walk you through yeah. this doc. He's going to get your lab work. He's going to check sleep studies. He's going to help you prescribe all that. But then the real question is, you take that prescription and you sit on it for three months and you're like, oh, man, I, I, I couldn't get away from what I'm doing or I couldn't do. Whereas the idea is that that person, hey, Evan, have you called them yet? Do you want me to call for you? Right. Do you want me to set the appointment? Tell me what your – give me your schedule for the next three months. I'll find a window for you. It's that that hand-holding aspect. And, and, and then and – then, in, in, in the final stage, I think what, what would be immensely is there is a centralized database, a location you can go that has all the programs that have been vetted and gives clear understanding, a clear education of what it exactly is, yeah. how much time, how much whatever, <clears throat> and then and then the the impacts that they've seen, right? The the data that they're showing, and then also. You and me, you, we go whatever program we hit. We we do a video. Man, this is what happened to me when I went. And so it's the it's the the bona fides of, mm-hmm. of the vetting from us itself, or the spouses, or the children, whatever. And I think you know that's the idea. But again, everybody's jockeying for that next twenty five thousand dollar donation. That next whatever the. 2,000 here, 3,000. It's very rare that people can go out and raise 400, half a million dollars at an event in a year unless you're one of the mega groups. Right, right. Just doesn't take place. Yeah, you have to have a really um, attractive offering from a name, right? So, like, you know, that that's this one thing I would say about the, the SEAL teams is they have a name that is very attractive for donors, you know, being active within you know, a couple of different Green Beret foundations, you know, they just, they're not as, they're not as successful at raising money uh, as like the Navy SEAL Foundation is extremely successful at raising money. I, I can't, I don't exactly know what their endowment is, but it's, it's, it's large, it's big. And that, and that's not meant to be critical whatsoever. It's to a civilian with a checkbook, they want to be, or, and part of this is, is like they, they want the association of cool, right? That's right. And it's like, oh, I'm going to go to the gala. I'm going to be around a bunch of team guys. You know, I'm going to be around a bunch of frogmen or whatever it might be. Yep. And they're going to be, okay, cool. I'm going to get out my Goldman Sachs checkbook. I'm going to write you a hefty check because I got this experience. I got to I got to get close to touching the stone, whatever that might be. Mm-hmm. And there's just not a lot of organizations that have that type of weight and gravity that's connected directly to a civilian uh, characterization of, of the special operations. Yeah, it's well said. Yeah. Very well said. yeah. Brilliant. It's, it's, it's just the facts. And, you know, we, we work a lot with like third option foundation mm-hmm. and some of the other third option is, is mainly geared towards uh, the paramilitary CIA side of yep. things. Um, but they're, uh, <laughs> It's a clandestine. It's a clandestine organization. So it's like you got to have guys that are worth 
hundreds of millions, if not billions, that are stepping into these rooms. That's right. And the unfortunate reality is you also have to host galas. And I can't tell you guys how many galas I've been invited to and said, because that's just not my fucking thing. I can't do it. I'm like... I'll re- I'll send you the money. I can't I can't be I can't I can't put a suit on and sit at a table with a bunch of people clinking, you know, silverware wearing tuxedos, man. I can't I can't do it. Like it's just it, not it my almost thing. becomes like the gala usurps the intention. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's the party. Yeah. Right? It's the proximity. It's the like I was at this thing. I I, I get to wear the shirt and I get to go back to my my uh, hedge fund corner office and tell people that I was around a bunch of operators. And by the way, I, I commend people for, for, for directly wanting to be charitable and support the organization. Right. That is not meant to say you shouldn't. It's meant to say the intention of the organization and the guys that are in combat and Derek, um, um, a couple guys that we've, we've, we've done a lot with over the last few years. Um, we were talking about this, you know, he's an infantry officer, lost his right leg, and he would talk about how it's almost impossible for guys that were in the infantry to raise money specifically oh, around their injuries. Absolutely. But he's like, he's like, you throw around a green hat or a trident, and then, you know, people people jump over each other trying to write a check. And he's like, so my leg is less important than the guy that was in the teams that did a bunch of really cool, you know, night hey ho into here and there and everywhere. It's like it's just it's discouraging for some people. Yeah. It yeah. is. It's discouraging. Yeah. yeah, for sure. How could it not be? Yeah. Yeah. And I I the think way I think there is a solution to that. And this is my hypothesis. You know, and and you know, I, there's a way to do it. And I think it's about personalizing the investment. Mm-hmm. We we have now moved into a space where stroking the check, in many cases, in particular with the smaller nonprofits that are out there, you stroke that they have their little thing. You raise the 150, 100 in the night, and you have the gun giveaway and all this, mm-hmm. and it's all this, and then they give that money to that charity, and it's like, I wonder if they're actually going to use this for right. anybody, right? And so what I believe. My hypothesis is that if you can directly correlate the donation to an individual, right? You 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 say, hey, this is Operator X. Here is how many deployments he's done. Here is all of his awards. Here are the units, if he wants to describe that. Oh, and then here's what he's dealing with. Mm-hmm. He needs to go to these few things here. If you donate to him specifically for this basket or this program, you're going to be able to follow him. Let's call it 10 grand. You de- right. dedicate the 10 grand. You get three people that donate combined to get that 10 grand. Well, now you get updates on how the individual's doing, how they're doing. Like I, I, Chris used to be involved with a program called the Synchrony Program, which was at Methodist Hospital, and he wrote that he did that with with Doctor Alok Madon, who's one of the world's leading psychiatrists, psychologists. And, psychologists, sorry, and and a bunch of other very you know uh, um, well intending focused clinicians that wanted to really help us, and I had one of my best friends was just crashing, like crashing was was had suicidal ideations all day every day and could not shake it and as we learned out later it was the the command psychiatrist who had prescribed him medication that genetically induced <laughs> suicidal inclination without giving him a blood test to understand that right mm-hmm. so it just and this was a dude that is not that guy ever right. in any way he's the ultimate spartan right and I was like, well, well, how much is synchrony? And they're like, $25,000. And I'm like, all right. And I went to an individual who had met him at my wedding, and we had hung out and got to know him, and very successful guy. And I said, hey, listen, you know, I I would never ask you for anything. And he was incredibly gracious to me in many different ways, in a bunch, especially when I started speaking, his company hired me a bunch. And 
I said, you know, hey, listen, I will never ask you of anything at that level. It's just not what I like to do. But he, if he doesn't get this help, he could die. I mean, at any minute of any day. And he wrote that check right there. Every single time I see the man, and he lives in, in Boca, every time, hey, how's he doing? How's it going for him? How's his mental health? Mm -hmm. How's it taking, you know? And there's that connection to it because that desire, mm -hmm. that proximity is powerful. So let's direct it instead of writing a check for an organization that is stockpiling large numbers of, of, of reserves. No, you're going to give me $10,000. I'm going to take 750 of it for administrative costs to keep this thing going. And the rest of that money is going to this individual, to this program, and I'm going to send you a follow-up. Or better yet, the operator will give him your email. I'll let the operator through an anonymous email right, or through yeah. that, send you and say, hey, Evan, thank you so much. That just saved my life. But they told me I need to now go get these therapies. Right. And I'm going, you know, you get back in a rotation. Well, now you can cultivate that relationship so it's not me as my nonprofit hoarding your wallet as they all do. Trust me, it is a battle for wallets out there. They all know who the donors are in their communities, what, who shows up. I mean, every charity I worked with, and I worked with about eight different charities for about 10 years trying to figure this all out. They all know exactly who the wallets are in the room. They know what they're good for every time. And it's, it's, it's a science right. essentially. I want to disband that. I want the emotional connectivity for you and me to where Man, you know where your money is going and what it's going to, and more importantly, who is getting it. Right. And I think you would see this resurgence in faith in 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 support in the support networks that have lost a little bit of their um, um, what is it uh, um, enticement. Right. right. Well, you take it from the abstract to the very human, very personal. Yes. Well put. That way. Yeah, it's 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 similar. It kind of reminds me of like uh, the adopt a child it's, type it's, initiative. It's right? exactly Where, Sally Struthers. Yeah, yeah, it, it, that, yeah. That's the model. Right. Because I, I, I as a kid, pro 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 probably the most impactful like nonprofit stuff I saw. And my parents were immeasurably involved in nonprofits my whole life, so I always watched my family. My parents contribute, my, my mom starting charities, my, you know, my dad being on the boards of all these charities. So it was always a component of, of my family growing up. But I was always like, well, you know, where does the money go? And, right. and now yeah. having been involved in this aspect of it, it's, it's, it, is the, it is the relationship. It is knowing that, 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 you know, that those three kids from the Philippines or from Peru or from whatever – and you're getting their their picture in a in a rundown of how they're doing with the money that you're sending, that's powerful, man. Yeah. And and that that organization was very successful as a result. And I I just think there's enough people out there that would be willing to do that. Again, I you know I think a lot of it is in in uncertain times people are a little bit more reticent to uh, you know donate large checks, but. I think if there's a focal point like you were asking, you're God for a day or you're king for a day, whatever, mm -hmm. how do we generate a, a, a centralized location with all these satellites that it then there's this, you know, the top of the, the funnel, here's the guys or whatever. You, there's a list of 300 guys. Oh, I for some reason I connect with this guy. Or my, my father was a Marine recon in right. Vietnam. This guy from MARSOC. There's just something I feel I want to support that guy and, you know, something like that. I mean, and you know, it, it, it seems like it would be a, a lofty endeavor, but I, I think with the technology we have out there right now, it's it's definitely a feasible option. It should be. You would think that it, uh, a technology integration, organization, and then, you know, process with execution, not that actually that complicated to build 
Now, the, the 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 actual labor required in what I would say is vetting and going through right. the organizations and application process, like the tech stack wouldn't be that complicated. It just wouldn't. It'd be the organization behind the tech stack that would right. be more complicated. Right. Because, yeah, I mean, you are dealing with a litany of things that are yeah. substantial and it is, you know, it does require the, the human element of making sure the individual is going to the right place, the right time, and with the, the right support and help that they need. Yeah, I, I agree with you for, for sure. We just came up with an idea that creates hundreds of jobs for people. To That's <laughs> right. Hundreds of veteran jobs. Hundreds of veteran jobs. Like, yeah. Literally. Yeah. yeah. You're pretty smart over there. <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, what, what, what can you uh, send us out with? I'm going to put you on the spot. Oh, well. I mean, I think we 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 have spent a lot of time today, kind of talking about the problems. But I would also want to emphasize there are solutions, and there are there are there's hope. There there are treatments that can help the operator, the family, help the other veterans, help the responders. We just need to be better as a society, as a country, as a nation. We need to do better about helping move the science, the research that's necessary, but also the dissemination of that research and then bringing these solutions together. For an individual who's listening, who's suffering, or who knows somebody who's suffering, uh, again, the Seal Future Foundation website has a lot of really good information on it. I, I hope my book, I hope our book, they've helped me write it. A lot of other operators helped me write it. I hope, I hope it's, it's a resource that can be useful as well. That healing and recovery is out there, but you, it's not easy to get. You got you got to really put in the effort and the determination. So if you approach it like you did your career, like you did selection, if you if you think of if you're struggling with a civilian society that's indifferent and unfamiliar, uh, I'm going to quote Herb Thompson, who has a powerful words in my book. He says, "Approach it like an, a new indige." Mm -hmm. Dave. My biggest thing is is for the guys not to lose hope. Um, you know, I, I know, you know, the, the old saying, if you're struggling, reach out, right? We're everybody, hey, man, I'm available. Call me, whatever that. But unfortunately, it's just not good enough. And so, you know, I think first and foremost, educate yourself. Mm -hmm. Go read this book or... If you don't have time for the book, download the paper that's available mm -hmm. at, at chrisfree.com. Um, you can, you know, the paper's available. You can find it. Operator Center and Paper Journal is online. It's a we'll put we'll put links in uh, in the cool the YouTube and Spotify. Thank you, too. thank you. Read the paper, and so you know what you got, and then and then you have an execution checklist. Mm -hmm. You have that scale. You have all right, okay, man, this is where I'm at, and then take that paper or this book to your primary health care provider and say, hey, can I sit down and explain this to you? Right. Just, I need, I need 20 minutes. Just book me at your last appointment of the day, right? Be proactive and say, this is everything I think I'm dealing with. Can you help me? And I'll help you figure it out. I just need you to help evaluate the process, the write the prescriptions, give me the guidance, connect me to the MRI place, whatever mm. it is, I need help. And, and, and if you can get that going, that, that tempo, and, and, and generate an op-tempo for your own <laughs> survival, yeah, yeah, for your own survival. And your families. And your families, for sure. You, you'll get it. It'll settle in. It'll start going. Because, you know, there, there are now guys out there that this has been around and they know and they're getting into a good system where they're doing better than just managing. They're, they're actually seeing improvements. The treatments are working. They're reducing inflammation. They're sleeping better. They have a better engagement with their families. They're, and now what you see, which is the beautiful, it's my favorite aspect of, 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 of being a part of this community, is that once you feel good, and you start feeling strong, what do we want to do? Share. We want to share, yeah. and we want to help each other. Mm. You know, I, I, you know, one of the reasons I love you as much as I love you 
is because I've always felt that from you as a part of who you are. And I think you is reciprocal for me. It's like, man, all I want to do is help you. But I can't do it if I don't feel strong. And so we need to help get these guys to back at just that momentum mm. and that motivation to know your life is not over. There, there is a trajectory. It's complicated. It's not smooth yet. But there is a way. There's a system that you can put together and, and, and the rest of us. And, and the more guys we get that believe in this, that believe that, hey, there's, there's a, a framework for what you're dealing with. It's not, you know, it's not completely, uh, you know, hopeless. And, and then there are programs out there that do have a, an impact. But as you, as you went through a program yourself recently, and, and it's kind of wearing off, and that's what happens. You go to do these treatments, and then it wears off. So what's the next thing mm -hmm. that gets you to the next six months? And, then, and that's what it is, unfortunately. It's maintenance, and it's going to be a lot of maintenance for the rest of your life. But once you start feeling that strength brewing you, now you start serving because you know five dudes that are struggling. You know your buddies that are hurt. Hey, man, I just did this. You got to go do it. And, and I think the, the, the idea that there's a mission in this for you and the mission is your survival, you just have to – it's just like getting a couple under your belt, and I think – I think it'll make a difference, a uh, profound, and we'll stop getting phone calls in the middle of the night. No, I, I think you're 100% right. I would highly encourage everybody to pick up the challenge, uh, pick up the book, Operator Syndrome. We'll post a link to it. Work through the checklist, and the challenge I'll put out to everybody is uh, go down the rabbit hole. Like make it, make it a mission to do your research. Try to organize it and then pass it along to other people. It could be sharing the PDF, sharing the book, uh, it could be sharing the checklist, it could be talking to your doctor and then pulling other people into it. But I would highly encourage and challenge all of the listeners out there to pick it up, pick up the challenge, and don't be, don't dissuade this in the context of operator, meaning if you're in the mill and you're, you're, you're engaged not engaged, if you're a firefighter or a police officer, grab the checklist, uh, go out, and what I would take, uh, or I would tell everybody is, there's one of my favorite books, it's um, Albert Camus, The Myth of Sisyphus, mm -hmm. which is embrace the struggle and delight in the hard work and the endurance of the event, and don't despair the hope is in the struggle. So turn that around and then share. That's what I got. Thanks, guys. Thank you, brother. Thank you.